may not be here now, but he will join as soon as he can, and then he probably has to leave as soon as he's done. Um, and then the third talk will be on TB vaccines, and that's uh, very exciting because um, TB is a disease that we've never been able to get control of. And so we really welcome you to the symposium. Um, we hope that we can share lots of ideas uh, between us, and we're really looking forward to hearing from the speakers. And so without much further ado, um, oh, sorry, I forgot to talk about the fourth speaker. <laughs> sorry, the fourth speaker is Shabir Mahdi, uh, who's going to talk about the COVID-19 vaccine. And uh, as you've heard, we've had the AstraZeneca results out, we've had the Novavax, Novavax and we've had uh, the J&J vaccine results out. And so Shabir is in an ideal position to give an overview of the COVID-19 vaccine. And as I mentioned before, we are very excited about the J&J vaccine rollout this week. So without further ado, let me not waste time. I see that there are now uh, many more people on the call. It's close to 100. Um, and so I think we're good to go. So Marion, over to you. Um, to everybody, I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining our first symposium of the year. We're hoping that we will have more of these. We've got one planned for, I think it's uh, June or July, so a few months from now, and we'll communicate about that. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, enjoy the presentations and looking forward to the discussion. So thanks, Marion. Over to you. Thanks so much, Amina. So just before we ask Reshmi to introduce us to vaccines, for those of us who are not basic scientists, I'm going to give a brief um, outline of who Reshmi is and where she comes from and why she's giving us this presentation. So Dr. Reshmi Desai is a senior scientist in HIV prevention units at the MRC. She's sub-investigator on the HVTN702 substudy, which is investigating mucosal systems in vaccine responses and HIV infection risk in a subset of participants enrolled in the HVTN702 study. She's also the PI of the Crown Coronation Study, which is a randomized placebo-controlled clinical trial assessing the effectiveness of candidate interventions in mitigating COVID-19. Having previously worked at UKZN um, as a PhD fellow at the Department of Therapeutics and Medicine Management, um, Rishmi, besides doing her basic training in microbiology, immunization, and biochemistry, also has experience in preclinical and clinical trials. Her interests are basic science embedded in maternal child health and community health through the implementation of clinical trials as well as health systems research. So Reshmi, over to you. We're looking very forward to your presentation. Good morning, everyone. Please tell me when you can see my slides. Got them. Okay, great. So the title of my presentation this morning is The Basic Science of Vaccines. And thank you, Marion, for that introduction. So the topics that will be covered in this morning's presentation include what is a vaccine, a brief history of vaccines, types of vaccines, how does a vaccine work, what is herd immunity, what are the ingredients of vaccine, how is a vaccine developed, and I'll be discussing some of the HPRU vaccine trials that we have been implementing and discussing some of their successes and challenges. So what is a vaccine? Now, a vaccine trains your immune system to produce antibodies, exactly like it would if you were exposed to the disease. But vaccines work without making us sick from the infection because vaccines typically contain pieces of either dead, weakened, or lab-made substances that stimulate your immune system. If we look at a brief history of vaccines, we've come a long way from the days of Edward Jenner and the development of the first vaccine against smallpox in 1798. Since then, the health of individuals around the world have been transformed by vaccines. Dangerous diseases have been eradicated and millions of serious illnesses have been prevented. Long before the availability of current vaccines, communities in India and China practice a procedure known as inoculation in which a material from an infected patient was rubbed into the skin of a healthy person. As a result of this procedure, patients would sometimes develop a mild form of disease, 
but ultimately developed immunity to the specific infection. So there are three main types of vaccines that will include your whole virus or bacterium, parts that trigger the immune system, that's parts of the virus or bacterium, or just the genetic material that provides instructions for making specific proteins and not the whole virus or bacterium. So if we look at the whole microbe approach, there are three types. We have the inactivated vaccine, also referred to as the killed vaccine. Now, this is the first way to make a vaccine. Um, it's to take the disease-carrying virus or bacteria or one very similar to it, inactivate it or kill it using either chemicals, heat, or radiation. The second method is a live attenuated vaccine. It uses living but a weakened version of the vaccine or one that's very similar. Now, the measles, mumps, rubella, that's your MMR vaccine, your chickenpox, and your shingles vaccine are examples of your live attenuated vaccine. The third type is the viral vector vaccine. So this type of vaccine uses a safe virus to deliver specific subparts called proteins of the virus or bacteria of interest so that it can trigger an immune response without causing the disease. If we look at the subunit approach, now, a subunit vaccine is one that only uses the very specific parts of the virus or bacterium that the immune system needs to recognize. It does not contain the whole microbe or use a safe virus as a vector. Now, the subunits may be proteins or sugar. Sugars. Most of the vaccines on the childhood schedule are subunit vaccines, and they protect people from diseases such as your whooping cough, tetanus, diphtheria, and your meningococcal meningitis. Now, the third approach is the genetic approach. It's a nucleic acid vaccine, which delivers a specific set of instructions to our cells, either as DNA or mRNA, for them to make the specific protein that we want our immune system to recognize and respond to. Now, to understand how vaccine works, it helps to first look at our body's natural response. So when a new pathogen or disease enters our body, it introduces a new antigen. And for every new antigen, our body needs to build a specific antibody that can grab onto the antigen and defeat the pathogen. Now, we can consider antibodies as the soldiers in your body's defense system. Each antibody or soldier in our system is trained to recognize one specific antigen. And we have thousands of different antibodies in our body. When the human body is exposed to the antigen for the very first time, it takes time for the immune system to respond and produce antibodies specific to that antigen. In the meantime, the person is susceptible to becoming ill. Once the antigen-specific antibodies are produced, they work with the rest of the immune system to destroy the pathogen and stop the disease. Antigens, antibodies to one pathogen generally don't protect against another pathogen, except when the two pathogens are very similar to each other, like cousins. Once the body produces uh, memory cells, which remain alive even after the pathogen is defeated by the antibody, uh, if the body is exposed to the same pathogen more than once, then the antibody response is much faster. It's more effective than the first time around because the memory cells are ready to pump out these antibodies against the antigen. This means that if a person is exposed to the dangerous pathogen in the future, their immune system will be able to respond immediately, protecting against disease. So vaccines contain weakened or inactive parts of a particular organism or antigen, and they trigger an immune response within the body. Newer vaccines being developed may contain the blueprint for producing antigens rather than the antigen itself. And regardless of whether the vaccine is made up of the antigen itself or the blueprint so that the body will produce the antigen, this weakened version will not cause disease in the person receiving the antigen, the vaccine. But it will prompt their immune system to respond, respond much more as it would have on its first reaction to the actual pathogen. Now, some vaccines require multiple doses that may be given weeks or months apart. And this is sometimes needed to allow for the production of long-lived antibodies and for the development of memory cells. In this way, the body is trained to fight a specific disease-causing organism, building up memory of the pathogen so as to rapidly fight it when exposed to it in the future. So in summary, when you get a vaccine, your immune system responds by recognizing the invading virus or bacteria, 
producing antibodies, which are proteins produced naturally by the immune system to fight disease. Remember the disease and how to fight it. So if you have been exposed to the virus or bacteria in the future, your immune system can quickly destroy it before you come unwell. And the vaccine is therefore a safe and a clever way to produce an immune response in the body without causing illness. So recently, many of you must have heard of the term herd immunity. So what is herd immunity? It's also known as population immunity. And it's the indirect protection from an infectious disease that happens when a population is immune. And they can be immune either because they were vaccinated or they've developed immunity through previous infection. Now, in a community, if only a few people are vaccinated, then one person is infected, the disease spreads rapidly. However, if lots of people are vaccinated, then the disease can't spread very far, so the whole community stays safe, and this term is referred to as herd immunity. Now, this is particularly important for those people who not only can't be vaccinated, but may be more susceptible to the disease we vaccinate against. For instance, the elderly, as well as your pregnant uh, woman and, and your infants or children. So what are the ingredients of a vaccine? So I've discussed the antigen. Uh, vaccines comprise of numerous ingredients. The antigen is just one ingredient. It's a killed or weakened form of the virus or bacteria, which trains our body to recognize and fight the disease if we encounter it in the future. Adjuvants, example, aluminum, which help to boost our immune response. This means that they help vaccines to work better. Preservatives, example, thiomacil, which ensures a vaccine stays effective. Stabilizers, example, gelatin, and these protect the vaccine during storage and transportation. Surfactants, which keep all the ingredients in the vaccine blended together, example, sorbitol. Then you have your residuals, and residuals are tiny amounts of various substances used during manufacturing or production of a vaccine that are not active ingredients in the completed vaccine. And last, you have a dilutant, and a dilutant is a liquid used to dilute the vaccine to the correct concentration immediately prior to use. So each vaccine under development must first undergo screening and evaluation, and they must undergo these tests to determine whether the antigen should be used to invoke an immune response. Now, this preclinical phase is done without testing on humans. An experimental vaccine is, is uh, first tested in animals to evaluate its safety and potential to prevent the disease. If the vaccine triggers an immune response, it is then tested in human clinical trials in three phases. Now, in your phase one clinical trial, the vaccine is given to a small group of volunteers. We need to assess the safety. We need to confirm if the vaccine generates an immune response and we need to determine the dosage. In a phase two clinical trial, several hundred uh, volunteers uh, are basically given the vaccine. Again, we want to further assess the safety, the ability to generate this immune response. And, but the difference between a phase one and a phase two are the participants have the same characteristics in a phase two as those people for whom the vaccine is intended. In addition, a comparator group may be included which is your placebo arm. A phase three is given to thousands of volunteers. Similarly, uh, a group of people who didn't get the vaccine but received a comparator product in your phase two. Again, we want additional data, additional information on the effectiveness and safety of the vaccine. Once all the data is available, there's a series of steps to follow. Um, including reviews of efficacy and safety, and this is for regulatory and public health policy approval. Now, a vaccine needs to be safe and it needs to be effective against a broad population before it is approved and introduced into a national immunization. to discuss the clinical trials that uh, we've been involved in at HPRU and discuss some of the successes and challenges of each trial. So at HPRU, we've been involved uh, previously primarily in HIV vaccine trials. And here is a list of our phase one to two trials that we've implemented and successfully completed. 
So your HVTN100 is a phase one to two randomized double-blind placebo-control clinical trial of your plate C LVAC HIV and bivalent subtype C GP120 MF59 in your HIV uninfected adults at low risk of HIV infection. So this particular clinical trial, the regimen elicited a robust immune response. It appeared to be stronger than those, than those reported in the RV144 trial in Thailand, and interim results met all goal criteria to continue with the phase two to three efficacy trial, that is your HVTN702. Your HVTN108 is a phase one to two A clinical trial to evaluate the safety and immunogenicity of HIV clade C DNA and of MF59 or AS01B adjuvenated clade C envelope protein in various combinations in healthy HIV uninfected adult participants. Now in this particular trial, all groups, all regimens demonstrated acceptable safety profiles. Further, all regimens had a high IgG response rate and improved CD4 response rate and magnitude. And the data from this trial was presented at a conference last year. Your HVTN111 is a phase one clinical trial to evaluate the safety and immunogenicity of HIV clade C DNA and of MF59 adjuvenated clade C envelope protein in healthy HIV uninfected adults. Now, both the prime boost and co-administration regimens were safe and may advance into efficacy trials depending on whether cellular or humoral responses are desired. In addition, this particular trial uh, also wanted to compare intramuscular injection versus the use of a needle-free bioinjector. And data from the needle-free bioinjector uh, showed a significantly higher CD4 T-cell response. So both your HVTN108 as well as your triple one, they were promising results for further development. Your HVTN702 is a 2B3 multi-site randomized double-blind placebo-controlled clinical trial to evaluate the safety and efficacy of LVAC HIV and of bivalent subtype C GP120 MF59 in preventing HIV-1 infection in adults in South Africa. So as I previously mentioned, this is the same product that was tested in your phase one HVTN100. However, the trial was stopped as the Data and Safety Monitoring Board found that the vaccine was ineffective in preventing HIV infection. So the analysis undertaken after at least 60% of the participants had been in the study for more than 18 months showed that there were 129 HIV infections among people who had the vaccine, while 123 people who had the placebo when the placebo arm became infected. Now, your HVTN705 study is currently ongoing at uh, our sites. It's a multi-center, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled FSC study of Heterologous Prime Boost Vaccine Regimen of AD26 MOS for HIV, which is an aluminum phosphate adjuvenated clade C GP140 in preventing HIV-1 infection in adult women. We've also affiliated to HBTN, and we are we were implementing the HBTN084 study, which is a phase three double blind safety and efficacy study of your long acting injectable cabotegravir compared to your daily oral tenofovir emtricitabine for pre exposure prophylaxis in HIV uninfected women. Uh, so in November 2020, the DSMB recommended that the sponsors stop the blinded phase of the trial and share the results. The PrEP regimen of the long-acting cabotegravir injection once every eight weeks was found to be safe and was found to be superior to daily oral uh, TDF-FTC for HIV prevention. And now the sponsor has plans for an open-label trial, which we will implement in the months to come. So as you can see, we've been involved in numerous phase one, two, and three trials. The take-home message from the HPTN702, which... Uh, we were quite despondent about. Uh, so the difference in the results between the RV144 trial, which occurred in Thailand, and the HVTN702 study has placed this vaccine field at crossroads. Evidently, region-specific trials of the same strategy are necessary. 
uh, the detection of immune responses in early phase trials like our HVTN 100 amongst low risk populations do not guarantee that um, the product will be efficacious and would man manifest uh, an immune response in advanced phase testing. In addition, when you compare the RV144 trial and you compare the HVTN702 study, we also need to factor in that the circulating HIV was different and also that, the, uh, that South Africa has a high incidence of HIV. So our upcoming study at the HPRU is the PREPFAC trial. It's a phase 2B, three-arm, two-stage HIV prophylactic vaccine trial with a second randomization to compare uh, TAF-FTC to TDF-FTC as pre-exposure prophylaxis. In the recent months, due to the current COVID-19 pandemic, we've been involved in a few COVID-19 vaccine trials, the first of which being your Novavax. So Novavax is a phase 2AB randomized observer-blinded placebo-controlled study, and it evaluates the efficacy and immunogenicity as well as safety of SARS-CoV-2 recombinant spike protein nanoparticle vaccine with matrix M1 adjuvant in South African adult subjects living without HIV, as well as the safety and immunogenicity in adults living with HIV. So the vaccine administered demonstrated 60% efficacy in South Africa and 80% efficacy in UK. Now in South Africa, the 60% efficacy in prevention of mild, moderate, and severe COVID-19 was observed in 94% of HIV uninfected participants. Now the second study we were involved in is the ensemble, and I think that the speakers uh, that uh, precede me. They will have a lot more information regarding your COVID-19 vaccines. But your ensemble was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled phase 3 study. And here we wanted to assess the efficacy and safety of your AD26 COV2S for the prevention of SARS-CoV-2 mediated COVID-19 in adults aged 18 years and older. So this is also a Janssen trial. Your HVTN705 is also a Janssen trial, and it makes use of your ADVAC uh, technology, which was initially used in the development of your Ebola uh, vaccines. But uh, coming back to Ensemble, all participants across different geographies, and including those infected with emerging viral variants, the vaccine candidate was 66% effective overall in preventing moderate to severe COVID-19 28 days after vaccination. And the onset of protection was observed as early as day 14. And the level of protection against moderate to severe COVID-19 uh, infection was 72% in the USA, 66% in Latin America, and 57% in SA post-vaccination. The last trial that I'll speak about is the Crown Coronation Study, which is uh, ongoing at our unit. It is an international Bayesian platform adaptive randomized placebo-controlled trial, and it's assessing the effectiveness of candidate interventions in preventing COVID-19 disease in adults. And this particular trial uh, is made up of three phases, the first phase of which we are testing the live attenuated vaccine, which is your MMR, in order to induce a trained immune response. Thank you so much for your time. Rishmi, thank you for that very um, informative uh, presentation. Now, are there any, I don't see any questions yet in the chat box, but are there any questions uh, to Rishmi? And as I said earlier on, you could put them in the chat box or you can raise your hand and hopefully I'll see it. So it looks, Rishmi, like you've stunned us all into silence with your presentation. Um, so I'll just get in. Amina asks, could you expand on the nanoparticle vaccines? Hi, Amina. Let me just take you back to my presentation.
we seem to have absolutely you coming Reshmi I've lost your presentation yes. I'm sorry I think I'm having some technical issues but it's fine uh, so with regards to uh, your nanoparticle vaccines so your nanoparticle vaccines are, are vaccines against an infectious disease and because there's so many new variants of pathogenic microorganisms and They've created challenges with regards to design of vaccines. Your nanoparticle vaccines have now become, have taken the forefront. Okay, so it's a new vaccine. It improves the e efficacy of existing vaccines and uh, specifically against uh, different variants, different uh, subtypes. Um, and some, uh, these vaccines are developed uh, from either using protein subunits or killed pathogens. Uh, compared to your live attenuated uh, vaccine. Uh, they also carry the risk of, uh, your live attenuated vaccines carry the risk of uh, pathogenicity under certain immunocompromised uh, conditions. So with regards to uh, this type of vaccine, it's gaining popularity, especially when there are different uh, variants of a uh, virus or bacteria in circulation. Nanocarriers are normally that are used could either be lipids, could be proteins, metals, or polymers. Uh, this could be of interest when we are thinking of our COVID-19 specific vaccines uh, because we, we want to now, we have different variants. Uh, there's mutations and changes with regards to the uh, proteins. Does that answer your question, Amina? Yes, thanks, Reshmi. Thanks, Rishmi. And now Prof Miller from Stellenbosch has another question for you. Um, when evaluating immunogenicity, why isn't cell-mediated immunity assessed? And could you discuss that a bit? Yes, thank you, Marian. Uh, Prof, I agree. It's uh, very important for us to assess uh, the cell-mediated immunity. And I think uh, very few studies uh, take that into consideration. However, as mentioned, in our phase one clinical trials, we did see that um, your HVTN 108 and your HVTN triple one took that into consideration. So I know they are being investigated in your phase one clinical trials. But in the studies that we have been implementing in phase two and three, uh, there's minimal mention of it, but it is very important. Thank you. Right. Are there any other questions? Amina. Thanks, Marit. Maybe take the one in the chat bar first because I've already, already had a chance. Okay, thanks so much. So, um, Lita asks, Reshmi, could you expand on including HIV infected persons in the trials and which vaccines may HIV infected persons get access? I can't see the rest of the question. Nita might have to fill it in for you. Um, Lisa, could you ask, it's just not coming up in my chat box, could you ask Reshmi your question directly? I thank you very much for the excellent oh, no, presentation, no. Reshmi. Uh, I just wanted to check... Uh, no, from the MRC. Yeah, no, I just want to check whether you are able to log on to the symposium. Let me just try and tell Ari that he's actually... Um, I don't know how to mute him. Oh, he's gone. Okay, sorry. Um, go for it, Nita. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I wanted to check about HIV-infected person. You mentioned that Novavax uh, did not include HIV-infected persons. So, which of the vaccines you present for COVID, which ones can HIV-infected persons get access to? And are there any specific criteria when they are included in the COVID studies? Thank you. Hi, Nita. Thank you for the question. So the Novavax study looked at um, persons living without HIV as well as those adults living with HIV. However, the results that were released um, 
They found efficacy amongst those HIV uninfected participants. And I think this is a key population. Um, as we've known from our successes and challenges with our HIV vaccine trials, that each community is different. Each community is unique. In South Africa, we have a high incidence of HIV, other infectious diseases, including TB. So vaccines need to be tested within this group. In terms of which vaccines could they possibly be offered, the trials that we're currently implementing, uh, for instance, our crown coronation study, includes HIV-infected persons. The only um, exclusion criteria here is that the participants need to be, uh, the, the CD4 count cannot be too low, that's uh, not less than 250. Um, if I recall correctly, um, as well as uh, it, it would be advantageous if they are on treatment. However, I agree that uh, your COVID-19 vaccine trials need to be tested um, in our communities, which have a high incidence of HIV. Um, and Novavax was tested. Amina, um, maybe you can add a few words uh, with what was observed with the HIV-infected participants in this particular study, the Novavax. Thanks for that, Reshni. The next question is from Dr. Mwangi, um, who asks, how safe are aluminium-based adjuvants? Yes, thank you for the question. So in our experience at HPRU, uh, we have used uh, aluminium as an adjuvant in a few of our HIV clinical trials, and they were all determined to be safe. Uh, for use. They were all determined to be efficacious and enhance the use of our vaccines. So with regards to my experience with using aluminum as an adjuvant, yes, it is safe to use in combination with the clinical trials that we have implemented. Thank you. Thanks, Reshmi. And there's another question about adjuvants um, from Jeff Verlinden, who asks, what is the current clinical status of potential use of novel aptamers as adjuvants for enhancing vaccine immunity? So thank you for the question, Jeff. So in multiple uh, clinical trials, uh, your HIV prevention uh, vaccine clinical trials, we've used the adjuvants to uh, boost the effect of the vaccine. I think there is widespread use of uh, adjuvants um, in, the, in the trials that we are implementing, that's your vaccine trials. Um, and then if we look at your COVID uh, vaccine trials, uh, just from the notes, Novavax as well um, included an adjuvant to boost the effect of the uh, vaccine. Um, so I think it's a, it's a strategy to improve the immune response to boost the effect of the vaccine. And I think, um, it will be used more. Uh, uh, it will be used widely in trials that are going to be implemented in the near future. I hope I've answered your question. But if I haven't, if there's anyone else on our on our team that would like to answer. Rishmi, it looks like you did a great job. Um, okay. So thank you so much, and you'll be pleased to see that all the questions have run out, so you must have answered them very well. So thank you for your great presentation. Oh, thank you so, so much. Okay, so what we're going to do without any further ado, given the rush and uh, speed with which this week is taking off, is that Nigel has just joined us. Um, this is uh, our next speaker, and Nigel Garrett, who's from Caprisa, is going to be talking to us about um, HIV vaccines. So, Nigel, welcome. Um, just as a brief introduction, I'll just read a little bit about who you are so that everybody who's not as familiar with you as some of us are knows exactly where you fit into the picture. So, Dr. Nigel Garrett is the head of the HIV pathogenesis and vaccine research program at Caprisa here in KwaZulu-Natal. He's a specialist physician in HIV and sexual health, uh, originally from the UK, and has been studying HIV prevention research in South Africa for the last five, nine years. Nigel is an investigator of record, 
for the HIV vaccine trial network, HVTN, as oh, well dear. as the COVID-19 prevention network, uh, studies which are being done at Caprisa. He's also the principal investigator on the HVTN 703 AMP trial, the HVTN 705 mosaic vaccine trial, and several phase one and two A HIV vaccine trials. So, Nigel, welcome to you. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on this very, very busy day. Um, and we're looking forward to your presentation, and you should be able to share it straight away. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for that kind introduction, um, Marion. I will now share my screen. Marion, can you just confirm when you see the slideshow? Yeah, please? got it, Nigel. Looking good. Okay, I'm just going to expand that now. Um, great. Um, are we good to go? Can you see my slide? Yeah, all nice and clear ah. and big. Okay. Um, you know, it's, a, it's a real great pleasure to uh, present here on this uh, great day, this uh, HPRU Scientific Symposium um, about HIV vaccines. And I also added in the BNAP research because um, that is extremely important currently in the HIV field. And there's a bit of overlap now emerging. So we're going to talk about past, present, and some future aspects. Um, so the outline is really a, a few slides from Caprisa with lab to the MRC. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about HIV vaccines in the past very briefly, and then also what we're doing in the present. Um, I'm going to um, talk about broadly neutralizing antibody studies and our Caprisa BINA program, which is uh, in full flow, and then talk a little bit about what I think the future vaccine and BNAP concepts will be, uh, where the field is heading, and then we'll conclude. So just for those of you who've heard of Caprisa but may not exactly know what Caprisa is, uh, here's just a slide to show our leadership. So Sinai Cooper is one of the sci uh, senior scientists in our mucosal immunology lab on the left. We are based at the um, Nelson Mandela Medical School in Durban, South Africa. In the middle, you can see our uh, uh, directors of the um, Caprisa, that's uh, Slim Abdul Karim, many of you know him, and Croatia. And our new deputy director, Kogi Naidu, I'm happy to announce that, uh, who's now taken over from Nesri Padayachi, who uh, has gone into uh, retirement. Now, the, below that, you can see the five sites that we serve. The DDMRI site is at the Nelson Mandela Medical School, right next to King Edward's Hospital, where we have our headquarters. And then we have four research sites, the Etiquini Clinical Research Site in town at Warwick Triangle, where we do a lot of the HIV vaccine trials. Then Vullundlela is a rural site near Hilton uh, in the Midlands, <coughs> uh, where we've been running the Tenochovir gel trial and other trials currently. Uh, Springfield is a site near um, King Dinizudl Hospital, where we focus more on TB research. And then Umlazi, uh, where we uh, run mother-to-child transmission studies, as well as pregnant uh, uh, pregnant women prep prep uh, demonstration projects, etc. Um, now, very quickly, the main goal of Caprisa is to uh, undertake globally relevant and locally responsive research that contributes to the understanding of HIV pathogenesis prevention, epidemiology, as well as TB HIV treatment. And we're part of some important initiatives. Um, so we host the Center of Excellence of HIV Prevention for the NRF. We are also part of a MRC collaborative uh, center for TB and HIV pathogenesis and treatment research. And then we are also a UAIDS, UNAIDS collaborating center for HIV research and policy. Now, first of all, I would like to congratulate the HPRU for uh, appointing uh, a, what I'm finding out at the moment, a wonder woman, uh, Amina Goga. Congratulations. I'm working with her on the uh, Sisonka preparation, the Sisonka rollout access program, 
and she's been absolutely wonderful to work with. Um, but here is, you can just see a few examples where the MRC and Caprice have already been working on together. Um, there's a strong interest in point of care technology for HIV and uh, SDIs. And I've been working with Andy Gibbs and Beth Spooner on those. Uh, I know Marion has been working with uh, Nesri for many years on TB research and MDR TB research. Uh, five of our sites have contributed to the Johnson Johnson Ensemble trial for the COVID vaccine. And now we are leading uh, the research side of the Sisonka rollout program that we are now currently involved in. Uh, on the right, you can just see a workshop we organized for STI management and uh, some of the MRC folks were also invited to that. Um, now, this is now moving ahead and we are strengthening our collaboration through the KwaZulu-Natal Clinical Trials Unit, which uh, was just awarded a few months ago. And we will be sharing leadership. So Croatia will be the PI, and um, we will have uh, three active sites uh, that will contribute to the HIV prevention network, the um, uh, treatment network, as well as the uh, pediatric network and HIV prevention networks um, at Etiquini, Omlazi, and Isipingo. Um, so this is a seven-year grant, and I'm hoping that we can really make maximize and make the most of this huge opportunity to work together and strengthen our collaborations in case of that. Now, uh, moving, moving on to vaccines, I have shown this slide in several presentations before. It's really there to remind everyone that we still have many infections uh, per year that has gone down a little bit since 2018 to about 1.2 million infections a year. Um, but it shows you a modeling exercise of what impact an HIV vaccine could have on the current epidemic. Uh, looking at different scenarios of scaling up uh, multimodal prevention technologies. Um, so you can see the dotted line is the impact of the vaccine. And on the right, you can see a table of, uh, of um, potentially infections averted uh, in correlation to vaccine efficacy. So that's really what we're aiming for, to come to a, a point where we can talk about epidemic control. And we strongly believe that we still need a vaccine to achieve that. Now, a very quick history of HIV vaccine research. Um, now, we discovered the HIV vaccine, uh, sorry, the, the virus in 1983, and it was in 1984 that the US government announced the first AIDS vaccine program. Um, the first HIV vaccine trial then started at NIH in 1987. Uh, in 1998, the Vaxgen uh, company initiated the first phase three, so the first large-scale trial of the AIDS vac uh, vaccine in North America and the Netherlands, and then shortly after also in uh, the first uh, developing country. Um, in 2000, the NIH uh, formed the HIV vaccine trial network, and we are obviously part of that. And in 2003, the US and Royal Thai government initiated the famous RV144, also known as the TIDE trial, a phase three prime boost concept trial with the Alva AIDS vac uh, vaccine. Now in 2007, um, the STEP and Pambili trials, uh, which investigated a human adenovirus 5 vector expressing three different uh, HIV proteins were halted due to safety concerns, and then later also due to lack of ethics. So these were two parallel trials in South Africa and in the US. Um, now, that was a time when I got involved in vaccine research, and it was a real low point in the vaccine field uh, at that stage. Now, then there were some additional analyses on this RV144 trial, which revealed a modest preventative effect in humans. You remember about a 30% effectiveness. And the additional studies really uh, came up with some correlates of protection and risk uh, from that trial. So uh, one of these correlates were the V1, V2 loop antibodies that were detected 
and, and were correlated with protection in the trial. So, so that obviously re-energized the, uh, the whole field. And in 2010, the Pox Protein Public-Private Partnership, also known as a P5 uh, program, was formed to build on these um, efficacy findings in RB14. If you want to read a little bit more, uh, two of us have uh, written a whole review on preventative HIV vaccine trials in South Africa and the history and all the detailed vaccines that were brought up. Now, here you can see essentially a schema from the time where, where I left off on the previous slide. So the RB144 uh, results became available in about 2009, showing a 31% efficacy. Um, and then what happened is the vaccine field designed a program led by the NIH um, called a licensure program uh, at the top or a development track. And in the, at the bottom in that box, you can see that in addition, uh, we launched a research track which was meant to, um, uh, yeah, uh, to, to provide additional information. So the, um, the development track at the top was essentially taking the Thai trial vaccine to South Africa uh, and testing immunogenicity in a setting where you have a very high, sorry, where you have a high prevalence uh, and incidence of, of HIV. Now that there were go and no go criteria there, and they were all met. So what happened next was uh, we slightly modified the vaccine to make it more relevant to the, the clade C epidemic. The clade B and E viruses are obviously circulating in the US and Asia. So clade C is our main uh, virus subtype. So, um, so we slightly modified the vaccine and launched the HVTN100 study in 2015. And many of you were probably part of running that trial in South Africa. Now, again, that trial showed very good immunogenicity uh, data and safety data. So that then moved to an efficacy trial called HAMBO HVT702. And I think many of you have been part of that study uh, in South Africa. Unfortunately, that study had to be stopped in 2020 early due to non-efficacy. The vaccine was found to be safe, but uh, that's where we are at the moment. Now, at the same time, the research track launched several small-scale studies, HPTN 107, 111, 108, and 120. Now, they were really designed to look at uh, different prime boost regimens, essentially to provide upgrades to the uh, licensure development track. Um, and we looked at the DNA uh, 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 vaccine as a priming uh, vaccine. We looked at different protein doses in those studies. We also looked at different adjuvants. So adjuvants are there to stimulate the body's immune response uh, towards the vaccine. Traditionally, we've been using alum. But in these studies, we also looked at MF59 and ASO1B. And then also we looked at different uh, delivery methods. Uh, rather than maybe a syringe, uh, we, we were looking at biojectives. So very quickly then, this, these are the, the results that were just, um, uh, just presented at, at Croy, I think. Oh, no, actually, it was Croy last year um, by Glenda Gray showing the uh, Alvac uh, or Humboldt vaccine, HV10 step 2 And you can see on the kaplan meyer curve, it's a little bit blurred, but essentially the placebo arm in blue and the vaccine arm in a red dotted line are almost overlapping each other. So uh, the incidence in the... Uh, Y-axis is was almost exactly the same in both uh, both arms. So that uh, then led to the trial to be halted. Now I'm just going to tell you a little bit. Hello. 
Okay, sorry. Uh, uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, all good, Nigel. Uh, okay, sorry. I think there may have been a recording overlaying these next two slides, which I haven't removed. Um, but anyway, I wanted to show you just very quickly here the uh, the 108 study, which is one of these phase 1, 2A studies. And they are very complicated. I was the international chair of this study. Uh, so you can see here, each arrow points towards a vaccination point. And then the month are 0, 1, 3, 6. So that's a common vaccination regimen. Um, we did prime. You, you call that priming the immune system at month 0. So day 1 and month 1 with the DNA vaccine. And then we uh, gave a DNA plus GP120 is the protein plus an adjuvant at month three and six. OK, so that was our main uh, concept. And then we looked at these immune assays at six and a half months. So two weeks after the um, uh, final vaccination and at 12 months. And on the left, you can just see a little bit about the different groups we looked at. So we used the MF59 adjuvant with a low-dose protein and then um, uh, AS01B with low-dose and high-dose protein. And, uh, and we also looked at a co-administration regimen. Co-administration only had three active vaccines, so that's in the, in the arrow below, uh, where we just injected at zero uh, months, one month, and six months, where we gave DNA protein and adjuvants. So you can see all this is a little bit uh, experimental and trying to work out which regimen can elicit the best immune responses. Um, okay, here you can see, uh, I'm showing this to show you a little bit how these vaccine uh, assessments work. So this is a safety summary of uh, our trial, the 108 trial. And it's just looking at uh, pain as a reactogenicity symptoms, pain or tenderness, and erythema. On the left, you can see all the different groupings. Um, and on the bottom, it says T1, T2, T3, T4, T5, T6, which is essentially all the different uh, vaccination regimens we gave. But what is interesting to show, see here is uh, that... Um, Basically, we can already see that the AS01B adjuvant, uh, which is T2, um, T3, T5, and T6, had more reactogenicity events than the MF59 um, arms, which is T1 and T4. So you can see that the pink bars are the severe events or the moderate events. Yellow is severe, blue is mild, and light blue is no reactogenicity. So you can see that the there were more moderate events with the ASO1B arm. It's just a quick way of just showing you roughly what we're measuring in these trials. Now here, this is a complicated slide. Uh, you can see the IgG responses. So these are the antibody responses and the magnitude of these responses against the clade C envelope protein in the vaccine um, at six and a half months. So at the top, you can see all these different color bars that tell you the proportion of people in the trial that had a response. So in the first column, that was placebo. No one responded. So that's what you expect. And then you can see most of the vaccines elicited a response in the majority of participants. Now, below that, you can see the titers of the response. And I just circled there the uh, boxed in the red box, the comparison between the MF59 and the AS1B adjuvant. And you can see that the AS1B adjuvant didn't only create more reactogenicity events, it also caused uh, elicited higher immune responses. So that's a very interesting trade-off we found in this study. Um, the next slide shows you the other thing we are measuring, which is T cell responses. So we're always looking at antibodies, so humoral responses and T cell responses. And these are measured with uh, ELISPOT assays, um, again at six and a half and 12 months. 
And it was very interesting to see that the low dose protein elicited higher magnitude responded than the high dose protein. So these are all things that we then take forward and they help us to design the next vaccine trial. Now, the problem now is for us that um, th we were expecting the 702 study to show us a efficacy signal, at least a weak one, so that we could build on that with these additional studies that we've now conducted, then optimize that vaccine. But the problem is that we didn't see an efficacy signal, so we're a little bit stuck and we may have to design a, a different approach now to the next vaccine uh, through that P5 program. Uh, I hope I explained that. Uh, maybe we can just cover that in a question if anyone has another question on that. Now I'm going to move on to the uh, HVTN705 mosaic vaccine trial. So that is an independent program run by Johnson & Johnson and uh, Janssen. Um, some of our sites were involved in the um, in the uh, initial study that was called Approach, um, and are now involved in the uh, the follow-on study called Imbocodo. Uh, now, this is currently the only phase two B three efficacy trial running in the world. Now, Johnson Johnsons are so confident about this product that they have already started a phase three study called Mosaico among uh, MSM and transgender people in the Americas, so in the US and, um, uh, and uh, South America and Latin America. Now, the DSMB has set uh, several times and has recommended to continue the trial as is. Now, the interesting thing about this vaccine is it is called a mosaic vaccine. So it has different uh, elements of different subtypes, uh, HIV subtypes in it, in its insert. Now that is actually a, a manufactured um, product. So you can see here that the map shows you the different colors, the distribution of subtypes across the world. Uh, and the green one, which includes South Africa, is subtype C. Um, and you can see in that mosaic template of the insert under number two that each of those colors are represented in the vaccine insert. Um, it's also a vector vaccine, which is well known at 26. It is not the same vector as at five that was used in the STEP trial and the Pambili study. So we are we're pretty confident that this is it has different properties, completely different properties to at five. And um, it also has a trimeric GP140 envelope protein, uh, which is specific for clade C in the Imbocodos study. Now, this is a placebo control trial of 2,600 participants. It's a prime boost concept. So I'm giving the at 26 uh, vector mosaic at month zero and three. And then at month six and 12, there's a booster which includes a protein and the alum adjuvant. Um, now, just to give you a very brief overview here um, of the um, studies that we are running at Caprisa, and I'm sure that's similar at uh, the MRC, but we are running the 702 and 5 studies, the 108 and 107 studies, and we also started a large antibody mediated prevention program. Uh, Marin, I think I'm going to move on to the antibody mediated prevention uh, study now. So moving on to the BINA program. Um, this is a large scale study that has just been reported on. Um, so I wanted to mention this. Uh, again, there were uh, uh, 2,700 participants in this study receiving the VRC01 antibody in uh, every eight weeks as an in fusion uh, for HIV prevention. Now, um, this is a study that's run over about two years, and the results have just come out. It's a proof of concept study that was really there to, 
to show whether we can, whether antibodies can prevent HIV infection. That was the main purpose of the proof of concept. Um, because antibodies are something we are trying to elicit with the vaccines. Right, so the, the, the main headline result of these of the study is essentially that um, uh, antibodies can protect against uh, viruses that are sensitive to the antibody. But unfortunately, antibodies cannot protect against viruses that are resistant to the antibody. So I'm going to show you this in, a, in the next slide. It's again a graph on the left and then a table on the right. Um, you can see three dotted, three lines, light blue, the purple and the orange. Now, uh, at the bottom, you can see a concentration, less than one microgram per milliliter and one to three or greater than three micrograms per liter. Now, this is uh, the sen insensitivity assay of the antibody against the circulating strains. Okay, so if the, if the uh, antibody neutralizes the virus at a very low concentration, you can see the if prevention efficacy, the blue the light blue line is almost up to 75%. Now, if the uh, virus is partially resistant or very resistant, you can see the purple and orange lines, it essentially um, ends up at the 0% prevention efficacy. Um, now this is also then uh, uh, depicted there in in the in the in the table, and you can see the the prevention efficacy is seventy five percent for for uh, sensitive virus. Now the problem in this trial was that only thirty percent of the transmission virus was sensitive to VRCO one. So this is now why everyone is talking about combination of antibodies, very similar to the antiretroviral treatment program in the uh, early 90s, and then um, how people added in additional uh, uh, drugs, went for more combination drugs to, to cover the virus. Now, very quickly, um, this is the timeline of uh, the discovery of a antibody called CAP256V2LS in South Africa. So this is a study we started, the acute infection study in uh, Bulland Lela and in uh, Durban. Uh, and we've been following these women since 2004 until now, so about 16 years. Uh, and uh, one of these participants enrolled in very early in 2005, contracted HIV, and then was started uh, on ART at the time the guidelines didn't require immediate start but in 2009. Now, we had a continuous blood specimen of these uh, participants, so we were able to identify broadly neutralizing antibodies in the titers of these, uh, in the plasma of these participants. And then we're able to isolate some very strong ones, and that was all described in the literature. Um, in, later on in 2015, with the help of the Vaccine Research Center at the NIH, we were managed to clone some of the B cells that uh, produce that antibody. And this antibody essentially has now gone into production. And we're planning a whole host of uh, studies uh, called the SAMBA trial program. And I'm just going to show you that very quickly. So these are, it's a trilogy of trials, uh, O12A, O12B, and O12C. A is more about finding a good antibody to pair CUP256 B2LS with. Uh, 12B is the actual safety study, which is currently uh, ongoing. And then CUP2, uh, uh, O12C uh, is meant to start later uh, this year, uh, where we're going to look at a combination of antibodies uh, of 256 with BRCO7 for HIV prevention. Very quickly, this is the O12A trial. I think I'm already a little bit running late, so I'm going to go through this very quickly. But essentially, it's a safety study of VRCO7 and PGT121. 
This is the uh, CUP256 study that has almost fully enrolled now. The, so we're looking at uh, IV infusions of the antibody, subcutaneous administration of the antibody, and then also uh, uh, giving the antibodies subcutaneously with a, uh, a quite novel dispersing agent called, called Enhanced by a company called Halozyme, which allows to give higher doses of, of volume. Uh, without causing pain or induration at the uh, infusion site. Um, now there, uh, I hope you can see this, but there are many other um, antibodies currently being uh, discovered and also uh, going into uh, production. Um, so, it's, so the HVTN, for example, are planning a large scale um, antibody trial as well with two antibodies or even three antibodies for prevention, including PGDM 1400 and VRCO7 as well and PGT121 LS. So we may be taking part in that program through the HVTN as well. But essentially, the combinations of uh, um, antibodies is all about uh, covering the breadth of virus and choosing high potency. And to do that is to uh, combine different types of antibodies, antibodies that bind against the C4 binding side of the virus, but also antibodies that target the V1, V2 loop of the, of the virus. So that is the correlate of protection in RV1.04. Now here you can just very quickly see uh, schematically how these antibodies actually evolve in a, in a, in a human. This is a paper by Petty Moore, if anyone is interested in, which describes the development of this 256 antibody uh, and uh, how non initially non-specific um, antibodies um, uh, force the virus to immune escape and change its glycan shield, so the, the sugar shield around it. And then um, these additional antibodies slowly evolve that have longer arms, etc. So um, this, the reason I'm showing this is because we are now looking at vaccination programs, uh, experimental vaccine studies, where we can, uh, what they call shepherd uh, the immune system to uh, create broadly neutralizing antibodies. So it may have to be different immunogens given at different times to trigger the, the uh, the, uh, the body to make uh, B cells to make broadly neutralizing antibodies, because we know in humans it takes up to two to three years to get to that state. Now, here is a schematic view of that. This is a review by Dennis Burton, who's worked on this for a long time. There's also a uh, Bill Sheaf, who's uh, published a lot on this. And I know the HVTN are now trying to move this to a uh, clinical concept. Um, but essentially, you have a what they call a native uh, a virus, and uh, you you basically create a native uh, trimer to stimulate the initial immune response. Then you uh, adapt the trimer to shepherd the the antibody evolution into the direction of BNAPs. So it's like an intermediate BNAPs, and then we have a germline targeting immunogen, which means that we really want to get the body to make these BNAPs. Um, now, this has been tested in, uh, in animals successfully, and it is now at the stage where it will enter human trials, and I'm sure we will be part of that. Uh, I think this is quite an exciting feat. Now, I've added this slide uh, because uh, we are in the middle of a huge pandemic at the moment, and a lot of the uh, vaccines that have been developed for COVID were originally designed for HIV. For example, the chimp adenovirus vector uh, for the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, was developed that way. We are working already with DNA vaccine in the HIV field, and Sanofi Pasteur, uh, sorry, um, some of the um, yeah, have, have developed DNA vaccines. 
The mRNA vaccines have been extremely effective in the COVID field. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot more activity around designing those for the HIV field. Um, and, and obviously also antibodies have been used in, in uh, passive immunization and um, uh, studies for COVID. Uh, you, you know that some of these products have now come on the market to support uh, outbreaks in, uh, in um, care homes, etc., as an immediate way of treating people. Now, um, what are the unique challenges to HIV vaccines? Just to bring us back, why has this taken so long? Why are the COVID guys racing ahead and we are not? So um, the HIV essentially attacks CD4 cells. We know that and thereby weakens uh, the actual conductor of the immune system, uh, which then is, uh, doesn't lead to effective clearance of infection. Now, secondly, the virus continuously mutates and recombines, resulting in extensive diversity of viral strains. It's an RNA uh, virus, so similar to COVID in that sense, but it's much less stable than uh, genetic code than uh, the COVID uh, code. And there's no good real model of natural clearance of infection in HIV compared to COVID. Um, which really prevents the discovery of these correlates of protection that are crucial to us at, to advance the field. So we know that V2, uh, V1, V2 loop antibodies may be protective, but that's really our only signal. So we, will, we need more signals, which would also allow us to run trials quicker, just looking at these correlates of protection. Uh, now, this is an era of new vaccine concepts, except the example of the mRNA vaccine for the prevention, we've already discussed that. And just so in conclusion, uh, Compresa likes the MRC and we're looking forward to working with you over the coming years. HIV uh, vaccine research has had its ups and downs, certain disappointments as well, but we are eagerly awaiting the R26 mosaic vaccine results. Um, you know that the vaccine, uh, R26 vaccine was very effective in, 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 against COVID and we're trying to roll that out now. Now, everyone talks about these bean apps, uh, but we now know that it's not as simple as that, and we will need combinations for HIV prevention. Um, the role in treatment is still being discussed, and whether there's a potential role also in, a, in cure uh, is another question we are looking at. And then we may require sequential vaccination to shepherd the immune system to make an, an effective immune response against HIV. So, uh, Marion, I stop there. I just would like to quickly acknowledge our research team at our site, and particularly Nevashni Naika, uh, one of our lead PIs on the vaccine program, and Dr. Sharana Mohammed, who leads the antibody program together with uh, Slim and uh, Quraysha, and the whole Caprice team. And also our collaborators at NIC, Dylan Morris and Penny Moore, have been fantastic. Uh, Karen and Williamson at UCT and Wendy Burgess and, and our lab and collaborators in general. Uh, so I stop there, Marion. Um, thank you for listening. Nigel, thank you so much for that. Uh, and we so appreciate you making the time when you're actually in the middle of a meeting at the moment. And also, I believe over the last uh, few days, or maybe it's a bit longer than a few days, over a week, you've slept very little because you're so involved with coordinating the J&J &J rollout in KZN. So thank you so much for your time and giving us such a clear and insightful oversight of the HIV vaccine and where we are and where we aren't and where we'd like to be. Um, I know you have to rush on to meeting, uh, to, to rejoin your meeting. And so if you need to go, Amina assures me that the team at HPRU will be able to field some of the questions. And those that we can't, we might have to email you and send the, the person a, a response. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, I don't see any um, questions in the chat box, uh, but I do see a hand, but I can't see whose hand it is. Would that person like to ask their question. Uh, Zeningi. Good morning, everyone. I'm sorry, the sound on my side uh, doesn't sound well. Hope you're hearing me properly. Uh, I'd like to know 
when this uh, HIV vaccine will be available to the public? Maybe Mary, do, we want, in do you want to take a couple of questions yes. and then I answer all at once, or shall I just answer? Sure. Um, are there any other hands? I can't. I can't see them because I've got you on my screen. Are there any other questions? Amina. I think there was a hand from Nobu. Oh, Nobu. Over to Nobu. Marion, maybe I can answer that question in the meantime. Uh, so, so we are all hoping uh, for an HIV vaccine. Uh, the world needs an HIV vaccine. Uh, some of our colleagues uh, from the slightly older generation, uh, you know, some of you may know Larry Corey and, and Tony Fauci and so on, who, just, who were involved when the virus was discovered, are still working their socks off in their late 60s and 70s to get us to that stage. Um, so uh, we were all very disappointed with these or humble results. Um, we're crossing fingers for the for the uh, Imbocodo trial. Uh, we should know about that result probably, I would say, early next year. Um, obviously, you know, when there is an effect, a strong effect, then sometimes these uh, trials stop early or if there's no effect, they may also st stop early. But uh, essentially, the follow-up still continues until about, I think, the, the, the first quarter next year. So at that point, we will be able to tell you whether this vaccine works. In the meantime, we will carry on uh, doing as much as we can in terms of HIV prevention as a field and also in terms of HIV vaccines. Thank you. Thanks, Nigel. Nobu, do you have a question for Nigel? Marion, you're on mute. Oh, sorry. I'm assuming, Nobu, you don't have a question. Are, are there any other questions? Okay. Nigel, thank you so much for your time. And thank you all um, for that. Nigel, we're going to let you go so you can get on Bye. with all your coordinating. And for the rest of us, thank you for this great time. So we'll have a couple of minutes body break. And then we'll all be back here at 25 past 10 to listen to Tom Screeber telling us about TB vaccines. Thank you, Marion. Thank, Thank you, you, Nigel. Thanks, Nigel. Thanks so much. That was fantastic. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, so it's 10.25, um, and I think we need to get going because... Um, Tom and then Shabir later are both very busy people with lots to do. So, Tom, good morning and welcome, and thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, so, we've had this morning, Reshmi gave us a brief introduction about what vaccines work, and then we had um, Nigel Garrett from Caprisa talk to us about HIV vaccines. And now Tom Scriba, Professor Tom Scriba, is going to talk to us about TB vaccinations. And um, Tom, you can see his pictures already up there. And just as way of Tom's introduction, to this year is the 100th anniversary of the TB vaccination. So um, the pathway with the TB vaccination compared to HIV and um, COVID is very different. But Tom, thank you for joining us today. Um, by way of introduction, I'm just going to tell you all about who Tom is. Tom is a deputy director at the immunology of the South African TB vaccination initiative, which is known as SATV at UCT, where he directs the clinical immunology laboratory. Having trained in biological sciences at Stellenbosch, um, Tom went to Oxford where he studied uh, and got his DPhil in immunology and then returned into South Africa in 2006 working on pediatric and clinical immunology in TB and vaccinology at the Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine Unit at the University of Cape Town. Prof Scriba's research focuses on TB vaccine development, 
immunopathogenesis of the MTB infection, as well as development of biomarkers of key transition points between the clinical stages of M. tuberculosis infection and disease. Tom is funded by a number of competitive grants by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the European Developing Countries Clinical Trials Partnership, the SAMRC, as well as the um, NIH and the European Union. So, Tom, thank you for joining us and over to you. Thanks, uh, Marian, very much. And um, thank you for the invitation. Do you, can you see my slides and can you hear me? All good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so I thought I'd start off my presentation with this picture of an aeroplane that is essentially about 100 years old. Um, to highlight the stark difference in the trajectory that uh, TB vaccine development and COVID vaccine development uh, um, are going through. Um, so I work, uh, as Marion said, at the South African TB vaccine initiative. Uh, we've been doing TB vaccine development uh, um, in the Western Cape. So in Worcester, we have a, a, a trial site uh, and we work in Cape Town. Um, and so we've done to date 28 trials um, of nine different candidate TB vaccines, um, as well as BCG. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight this to illustrate that we've been doing this for a while. And of course, many people around the globe have been trying to tackle development of TB vaccines. Um, and I think uh, we can probably take a chapter out of the COVID book and and really try and accelerate this um, because there's a grave need uh, for vaccines, more effective vaccines against TB. Um, so TB is a, a global disease. Um, every single country on earth um, does have uh, TB cases. Uh, of course, that distribution is not equal. And we know that, for example, in sub-Saharan Africa, as this, this latest map here shows, this illustrates the incidence of TB disease per 100,000 people in different parts of the world. And you can see that the, the uh, darker shades of color here in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Southeast Asia, illustrate that um, these countries are much more burned by, uh, by TB. Um, so last year, um, there were 100 million TB cases diagnosed around the globe and 1.4 million uh, um, deaths were attributable to TB. These are, of course, estimates by the WHO. Uh, so the, the picture, um, if you track it over the last sort of 20 years, um, illustrates that we have had some success in controlling globally the TB epidemic um, because the blue curve that you can see there, which is the, the rate per 100,000 people, is, is starting to come down. So it's going in the correct direction. Um, but the, the problem is that this curve is not coming down fast enough. Uh, I would say that 10 million cases is way too many. And of course, 1.4 million deaths is, is inexcusable. We really must get this under control. Um, and in fact, I think the, um, the challenge that we are facing here in South Africa was um, very recently highlighted by the release of the results of the first national TB prevalence survey which was completed in 2018, but the results and the report were only announced last week. Um, and so what I wanted to draw your attention to here is that currently, according to this survey, there were 852 per 100,000 uh, cases of, of TB. This is prevalent cases of TB, uh, which is a very, very high number. Um, and probably, maybe even more importantly, um, uh, more than 50%, so roughly 58% of the TB cases that were identified uh, were identified based initially on an abnormal chest X-ray and were then found to be positive on expert um, uh, or, and or culture, um, suggesting that these individuals are probably largely asymptomatic, so they don't have any TB symptoms. Now, the reason this is very significant is because the way we normally identify and, and treat people with TB is by 
uh, finding individuals who have symptoms, so symptomatic TB, or we, in most cases, wait for people to turn up to clinics who are then sick enough to say, I need to present for healthcare, um, and then only as a diagnosis possible. And so we clearly have a, a very large number of people sitting with asymptomatic disease or, or disease that's not symptomatic enough to allow those individuals to, to get health care and to get treatment and to stop transmission. Um, so it's very clear that uh, prevention measures are absolutely key to controlling the TB epidemic globally and in South Africa. And of course, a vaccine that can prevent this from happening would be a, an ideal uh, intervention. Now, um, in, t in TB, it's a little bit different to many of the other challenges that we are currently facing, such as COVID and HIV, largely because we've already had a vaccine, uh, in fact, for 100 years. So BCG is the TB vaccine that um, almost all babies receive in South Africa and in, in most countries around the globe. In fact, this year we celebrate the centenary of BCG. It's been, it was given uh, to humans um, in 1921 for the first time. So we, we, we can review these, uh, what we know about BCG and, and ask, well, is there something that we can learn from this? How well does it work? Should we continue using BCG? And so um, this slide speaks to that particular issue. <clears throat> so what this slide does is it summarizes the efficacy that has been measured for BCG in preventing pulmonary or lung TB, and mostly in, in older individuals and adults, so adolescents and adults, but also in some cases um, children. And so each one of these red dots represents a different study. The, the dot is the level of efficacy and the error bars is the confidence interval around that estimate of the efficacy in different trials or studies. And so you can see that in some studies, for example, over here um, on the left, um, there was a pretty good efficacy, around 70 or maybe even 80 percent, and those confidence intervals are small, suggesting that we can be quite sure that the efficacy is in that area. And so this shows that BCG can prevent lung TB. Um, and this is very important because lung TB is responsible for transmitting the bacterium to others, and of course it needs to be treated to make sure that that person can recover. But you can see that in many studies, um, the efficacy level is very low, uh, maybe even negative, but I don't think that we should believe that because the 95% confidence interval crosses zero, meaning that that result is not significant. So clearly in many studies, BCG does not provide significant efficacy against lung TB. And in fact, in general, sorry, can, you, can you mute that line, please? In general, then, um, it's highly variable, uh, and so clearly not a universally successful measure for preventing TB disease. Um, so why do we even use BCG then? Well, there's another type of TB or form of TB that BCG, uh, BCG is much more consistent uh, um, at, at preventing, and that is called disseminated TB. Um, and there are two main forms uh, called miliary TB or TB meningitis. And this often happens in uh, young children or infants. And so you can see that in this case, um, not as many studies have been done, but the dots are all at the top here. So clearly there is much, much greater efficacy in general. Some studies still have very large confidence intervals, but these are usually underpowered, so they don't have enough power, statistical power to show their result. Um, and so we know that uh, roughly between 50 and 80,000 lives are saved every year because BCG can prevent these severe forms of TB. And so it's clearly not ethical uh, or warranted not to give BCG. And that's why we include BCG in our EPI programs around the globe. I just wanted to bring this point home with one uh, recent study. Um, so this was a study published by a group from Stellenbosch University who tracked the number of admissions to Tigerberg Hospital for tuberculous meningitis or tuberculomas in children. And you can see that in most years, the number hovers around sort of 30 to 40. But in 2017, there was this enormous spike in the number of hospital admissions um, for TB meningitis or tuberculomas. 
And this actually coincided with a period when the global supply of BCG was, was disrupted and we could not provide a, a good coverage of BCG vaccination to children in South Africa. And, and so clearly um, this illustrates the importance of providing BCG vaccination. The blue line here is actually the provincial drug susceptible TB notification rate of all types, which as you can see is coming down, which is sort of consistent with that WHO estimate. So clearly this was this is completely out of line with what's really happening. So this, this highlights the importance of BCG as a measure to, to prevent these severe forms of TB, but clearly we need much more to be able to stop pulmonary TB, which is a particular problem in, in our, our communities. <clears throat> so try and develop uh, new types of vaccine. I think we are all being exposed to this um, uh, a lot at the moment because of the COVID epidemic. There's a lot of discussion around about antibodies and about how, vac how well vaccines work. So I just want to highlight one thing, and that is that for TB, the evidence, and it's, it's pretty strong evidence, suggests that um, the, the mechanism that we would require to protect ourselves against TB is not dependent on antibodies, but is actually dependent largely on CD4 T cells. So these, these helper CD4 T cells over here. I will note that these cells are actually essential for most vaccines, um, even vaccines that use or that induce antibodies to protect ourselves against other pathogens, because these helper cells are essential to produce good antibodies and to allow antibodies to develop um, to the level where they are good at preventing uh, infections with viruses, for example. And of course, CD8 T cells are also important. So a slight difference, and I think this is one of the issues that, uh, that underlies why we don't yet have a successful vaccine for TB is that it's a little bit more difficult to induce excellent CD4 T cell responses than to induce excellent antibody responses. And it's much more difficult to measure these types of, of um, immune responses than to measure antibodies. So uh, many years ago, about 16 or 17 years ago now, um, based on this kind of evidence that we wanted to induce good CD4 T cell responses, um, one of the first new generation TB vaccines that was developed was called MVA85A. This was developed by actually the University of Oxford, so not that different from the concepts that led to the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine for COVID. But in this case, they took a modified pox virus called a vac vaccinia virus Ankara, which we knew was, was very safe because it was used towards the end of this, the smallpox vaccination campaign and it induced very good uh, anti antibody and T cell responses in those studies. And so what the, these investigators did is they inserted one protein from, from mycobacteria, from TB, that's called antigen 85A. So then inserted that gene or the blueprint uh, of that into this pox virus uh, vector. So this is a viral vector that is then admitted into the, uh, the body and it induces an immune response to this particular protein, which can then hopefully protect against TB. And so we are involved in a number of trials to test this vaccine here in South Africa. I'm showing you here some immunogenicity data from a trial that was done in babies in South Africa. You can see here the two groups. These babies received a placebo, and you can see there was no immune response over here. Whereas if we measure the immune response using an ELISPOT assay, which Nigel also mentioned in his talk, here we measure the number of cells that produce interferon gamma um, per million cells in the blood. And you can see that there's a, there's a very nice induction of cells that produce this kind of, these Th1 cells, uh, even seven days after the MVA vaccine was, was administered. And then that immune response naturally wanes, but importantly sticks around uh, for half a year after vaccination. And in fact, we went more than three years after vaccination and measured again this immune response. And you can see we actually had three different groups that received different types of doses of this vaccine. And these were all much higher, more than three years after vaccination than the placebo group. So this vaccine really induced a very nice memory response, a long lasting immune response to this particular TB protein. And so this then, this then led to a phase 2B studies in babies where we could test whether the vaccine could protect 
those babies against TB. So the study was conducted here in South Africa in the Western Cape um, at our trial site in Worcester. And again, in, the, in the, those, that population of about 2,800 babies, um, the placebos did not induce an immune response, but this, the MVA recipients over here did induce an immune response. And we could also look at the types of T cells, and we could see that those T cells could produce many different types of cytokines that we, we know uh, we think are important in protection against TB. So this vaccine really did what we thought uh, it should do. Um, and so the question was, well, could it prevent TB disease? And so I'm showing you here, and maybe just focus on this top line here. This is the endpoint one, the efficacy endpoint in the trial. There were 39 cases of TB in the placebo recipients, and there were 32 cases of TB in the MVA, 85A, the vaccine recipients. And so the vaccine efficacy was 17%, and it was not significant. So this vaccine was not efficacious at preventing TB disease, unfortunately. So that, of course, was very disappointing. The first vaccine of the new generation that had kind of reached these uh, this level of testing and we got some efficacy results and it just didn't show any efficacy. And I think it sort of highlights how fantastic actually uh, the results from the COVID trials have been where vaccines were developed really quickly and, um, and uh, a number of different vaccines and there was an enormous investment into that. And we've seen such excellent levels of efficacy in those trials. It's really fantastic that, uh, that those uh, trials have, have yielded such successful results, even though we are seeing issues with, for example, the, the variant that we have here in South Africa not, uh, not being susceptible to, to protection as well as the original strain. But it clearly shows that designing vaccines against, this, against COVID-19 will be is less of a challenge than against TB, for example. So since then, of course, um, a lot of introspection has happened um, and there's been a lot of thinking about, well, how, how do new vaccination strategies look like and what should we do now? Should we just give up or should we go to square one? And so um, a lot of thinking um, is based on the epidemiology of TB. And so with TB vaccines, there are actually different stages where you can administer, administer such a vaccine. Um, and one can be pre-exposure. That means before people are exposed to the bacillus, TB, mycobacterium tuberculosis, the MVA 85A vaccine targeted infants, and of course that would be pre-exposure. Most infants are not yet exposed to TB. Um, but another one could be a pre-exposure, pre so once people have already been exposed and are infected with the bacterium, um, and I'll get a little bit more into that in the next slide, and then there's also another indication where one could perhaps even try and vaccinate people who have active TB disease to try and uh, assist in, in curing uh, individuals who are already sick. So um, a key question that has come up is whether we can protect against infection. So can we vaccinate someone before they are exposed to the bacillus and then protect them from even becoming infected with the bacillus? And this is key because, um, first of all, over here on the right, um, this is how many people, the prevalence of those who have latent tuberculosis, essentially who have an, a TB, TB infection um, across age. And this was done in the Western Cape. And so the, the key thing to, to recognize here is that one would represent 100% of our population. So you can see that at a very early age, 10 years of age already, a large proportion of our population has evidence that they have been infected with TB. And in fact, by uh, young adulthood, um, this reaches 80 to 90 percent. So really a very, very large number of our, of our population uh, carries evidence of infection with TB. And so to protect those people against TB, one would really need a post-exposure vaccine. And if you wanted a pre-exposure vaccine, you would ha really have to come in at a younger age. Um, this then also highlights uh, what we know about um, the incidence of TB disease onset, which is really high in very young kids, but we have this sort of natural um, uh, period of low TB incidence um, in uh, slightly older children, but before they hit puberty, and then it really kicks up in, in adolescents and, and, and young adults. 
And so we really need to vaccinate people to protect against this, this age here where people really have a high incidence of TB. So based on the, that kind of information, uh, we then performed a, an experimental vaccine trial in adolescents um, who were not yet infected with TB. And this vaccine trial had two different vaccines that were being tested, BCG, which would be given again, BCG revaccination, and an experimental vaccine that is, has two proteins from TB in and in, in an adjuvant. And so we enrolled 990 adolescents and they were randomized to receive either placebo, BCG revaccination or H4IC31. Um, and we followed them up for 24 months. And the endpoint here was a, a blood test that tells us whether someone um, has been, it detects an immune response actually that tells us whether someone's been infected with TB. And so this, this trial really took advantage of this very high rate at which people become infected with TB during adolescence to try and see if we can prevent infection with these uh, two different types of vaccine. And so I'm just going to skip straight to the results. So the first efficacy endpoint or, or um, measure was whether people convert their quantiferon, this test that tells us that they've been infected. So here we asked, can people... Can these vaccines prevent people from an initial infection with TB? And as you can see in these curves, these go up when we, in, in, when we detect someone being infected. You can see that those curves don't really deviate much from each other. And if we look at the vaccine efficacy level for IC31 over here, that was 9.4%. Uh, with BCG, it was 20%. But importantly, the confidence intervals cross zero, which suggests that we did not see a significant difference. So unfortunately, these vaccines could not prevent inf initial infection with TB. However, there was another endpoint in the trial called sustained infection. And so what we did here is we measured when people become infected, but then we take two more measurements three and six months later and ask, do they remain positive for that test? So do they acquire infection and then sustain that infection? Um, and the reason we wanted to look at that is because we know that people naturally become positive, but then they actually become negative. And I'll show you um, in the next couple of slides a little bit more about that. And so you can see in the placebo arm, those who did not receive an active vaccine, there were 36 people who became infected, representing 12%, and then who remained positive. This is the positivity threshold here, this dark black line. In the age 4 arm, um, there were 25, so 8%, and in the BCG arm, there were 21 individuals who became infected and remain infected. And so when you look at those curves, you can see that the blue curve is higher than the other two curves. And in fact, we saw a 30% <clears throat> efficacy level for the H4 vaccine against sustained infection. This was not significant at the rigorous 95% confidence interval. But for BCG, there was a 45% efficacy against uh, becoming in, as infected and remaining, so sustained infection. And that was significant at both 80% and 95% confidence intervals. So for the first time, we had a signal um, that suggested that perhaps with a vaccine, we could protect against someone becoming infected and then maintaining that infection. So what does that really mean? Uh, this is a key question because generally these are not typically used endpoints uh, when we think about the epidemiology of TB. And so the opposite of uh, a sustained infection, which I'm showing here again, is reversion of this test. So where people pop up, they become infected, but then they go negative again. Um, and so what does this really mean? So, of course, the one thing it could mean is that people become infected and they actually then clear the infection. But um, we don't know that for sure because in TB we cannot actually measure the bacterium directly in the, in the body. We measure the immune response that tells us that the infection is there. And so this is key because um, as this paper which has just come out recently modeled, um, self-cleared MTB infection is probably a real thing. Um, and so based on very old autopsy data and TST reversion data, so tuberculin skin test or MANTU tests, which can also revert to negative, these investigators modeled that a very large proportion of people who become infected actually probably have, have 
uh, self-cleared MTB infection. And so a question is, well, does this, does this reversion that we see with these tests represent self-cleared infection? And I think the answer is probably yes to some degree. And so it's probably a very useful measure. But at the moment, we just don't have definitive evidence to confirm that. Um, so uh, there's another trial ongoing, um, much larger trial, that is again testing whether BCG can prevent sustained infection. And uh, we are confident that that trial will give us more evidence to, uh, to support this further. So that, that trial is currently ongoing at multiple sites in South Africa. Now, as I mentioned, the other issue is that a very large proportion of people are already infected. And so a pre-exposure vaccine cannot help those individuals. This graph shows um, the pre prevalence of people who we believe are already infected with TB um, just across populations in different parts of the world. And you can see that a very large proportion of the global population may indeed carry an infection. So we really need an approach to assist these people too. So we need a post-exposure vaccine for those people. And so there, there are a number of vaccines that are currently in development, and one particular one has really gone to late stage tests. This is called M72. It's, contained, it's composed of two different proteins that uh, have been put together and that are adjuvanted in this adjuvant called ASO1E. It's a very potent adjuvant. Uh, one of the ingredients is from is actually a natural product from the soap bark tree, which is a particular issue because it's a natural resource and so it's not easy to scale up. Um, but this vaccine was tested um, in many different places around the globe, including in South Africa. And so here's some evidence from a trial that we did, a phase two trial, where we looked at the immune response. And you can see that in uninfected people who are quantiferon or egron negative, the T cell response that's induced kind of kicks up only after two shots of this vaccine. Um, and is, is, uh, but there's, there's definitely a memory response. Um, but after, if, in people who are already quantiferon positive, who are infected, you only really need one shot and you get really high levels of T cells. So this is very high um, compared to many other vaccines that we've looked at. And those cells stick around. And there's also a very nice antibody response to this vaccine um, in people who are infected and those who are not. So clearly a very immunogenic vaccine. And so the results of a recent uh, efficacy trial um, that was done in Kenya and in Zambia and South Africa became available. And what this showed is that there was a vaccine efficacy of around 50% against uh, a TB disease in people who already had evidence of infection when they were uh, vaccinated. So a very exciting result. And we, we showed that for the first time, uh, people who are already infected can be prevented from progressing to active TB disease. And so you can see in this case, we looked this was um, three years after vaccination. Those curves are really still deviating, suggesting that there's probably quite a long-term uh, vaccine efficacy here. So very exciting and important result, which demonstrates that we can protect against TB. Um, and so, again, there, there's uh, a larger phase three trial that's currently being planned to follow up these results and to get to a vaccine that can ultimately uh, be rolled out. I will say that... Um, this kind of result for TB is, is not quite sufficient because the sample size wasn't quite large enough. You can see the numbers down here. It was just over 3,000 individuals. And so the sample size wasn't large enough to uh, allow licensure of this trial, which I guess is a little bit different to what's happening with, with COVID-19, where these kind of results are leading to emergency uh, use for vaccines. So I just want to end off by highlighting that there are actually a number of different products, TB vaccines, in clinical development. So this is preclinical over here, but we, we have three that are currently in phase one, uh, indicated for adolescents and adults. Um, there are four in phase 2A, four in phase 2B, and there are th three that are already in, in phase three testing. And as I mentioned, um, this GSK product will soon be in a phase three, and so will uh, perhaps the BCG vaccination if the, the trials that are currently ongoing show efficacy. And also to highlight that there are still some products in development for uh, infant vaccination. Um, these are actually uh, live attenuated vaccines that are uh, that aim to improve on BCG, so to do better than BCG, as well as a number of, of vaccines are currently in, in testing for therapeutic indications 
either after people have uh, received their TB treatment to try and prevent recurrence uh, or to actually be, be given alongside TB treatments to improve the cure rate for, for TB treatment. And so I don't have time to speak to these, but I'm happy to answer any questions about those. So uh, just some take home messages. The, the burden of TB is enormous uh, and, it, and we are really at the heart of, the, of this particular uh, problem over here in Sub-Saharan Africa. The complexity and heterogeneity of TB pathogenesis, which I wasn't really able to unpack in this talk, is considerable and is a massive challenge for TB vaccination. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> we need better tools to define this heterogeneity for effective vaccine development. There's a lot of work that's going, ongoing there. I didn't show you this, but um, natural immunity actually does provide clues about protective mechanisms that we can harness for vaccine design. There's a relatively vibrant pipeline for DV vaccine candidates. It's not hundreds, um, but it's a few uh, uh, sort of uh, between 10 and 20 candidates, which is something. And, and really, we need to press these through the pipeline so that we have many different options. Rational and data-driven advice. Advancement of candidates is critical and there's a lot of work that's going on going there and then I've shown you some examples of recent successes where there's been really renewed impetus in the TB vaccine development pipeline which hopefully will get us to a product in the next five to ten years that will be licensed and that will be new on the market. So I will end there and just acknowledge um, the large number of partners and uh, um, collaborators and colleagues that contributes to these efforts uh, over here and, and in, in many other countries and that there is a real, we're really part of this global effort to try and develop TB vaccines and to get something that, that we can use to prevent tuberculosis. And so uh, I hope I didn't go too much over time and happy to answer any questions. Tom, thank you so much for that. That was uh, really fascinating and you gave us a real idea of the breadth and complexity of TB disease, infection, and vaccines or lack of vaccines. We've got uh, time for one or two quick questions before we go on to COVID vaccines. I don't see any questions in the box, but I see a hand. Uh, would that person like to just ask their question? Um. Uh, firstly, I would love to say thank you very much for a very interesting talk. My name is Caroline Fule. So I was quite fascinated about your last results where you showed like one of the vaccines in the development showed about 50% uh, you know, protection for people who have already been infected with TB. So my question was, what's your take in terms of people who are immunocompromised, obviously who have other diseases like HIV co-infection, or maybe who have other non-communicable diseases like uh, diabetes, because there have been studies showing that those people could be susceptible to TB. So if you think of these patients that have been um, exposed to TB, but there is a possibility that the vaccine can be you know, effective, what's your take about those that are immunocompromised? Have you looked into any um, samples or patients as part of the study who are in that stage? Yeah, that's obviously a key question because um, clearly uh, TB and HIV coexist in many of these populations and we know that a large burden of TB actually occurs in people living with HIV. Um, so many of the TB vaccines have, have been tested in people who live with HIV um, and um, for except for live attenuated vaccines like BCG, uh, which for which there is a, a small risk of disseminated or uh, um, TB, or, or sorry, BCG disease, um, the vaccines are generally um, uh, safe and well tolerated in people who are HIV infected. Um, and in general, it looks like um, when CD4 counts are good and when people are on antiretroviral therapy, even the immunogenicity of vaccines is, is impressive. So, um, it, it is clear that TB vaccines need to be developed for people who, who are living with HIV and they are actually being developed for that. And uh, in general, um, phase three studies that are being planned, for example, for the M72 trial, uh, the vaccine, HIV infected individuals will be part of the trial population. But we don't think that we can power those 
for demonstrating an efficacy signal in HIV infected people. So they are included in trials so that we can make sure that we have safety data and that we can expand vaccine rollout when that comes into people. Um, and and um, that clearly has to happen. It's an important population that we need to cover with vaccinations. And we believe that if people um, are, or the data show that if people have suppressed viral load and aren't in antiretroviral therapy, then there should also be efficacy in those uh, in that population. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tom. Thank you, all of you. And Tom, thank you so much. That was a great talk. We're going to have to move on, I'm afraid. Um, but thank you for your time. Um, so we're going to move on to the last uh, presentation of our um, symposium this morning and welcoming Professor Shabir Mahdi uh, to our symposium. Shabir, we can't thank you enough for making yourself available at such a busy time. And I'm sure that all of us feel like you almost like a household name and you live a lot in our um, in our houses already at the moment. So it's great to have you with us. I'm sure you all know that Professor Mahdi is the Dean of Health Sciences and Professor of Vaccinology at WITS um, and co-founder and co-director of the South African Leadership Initiative for Vaccinology Expertise. Prof. Mahdi completed his undergraduate and postgraduate training at WITS and then qualified as a pediatrician in 1996 and got his PhD in 2003. He currently also holds position, the positions of director of the SAMRC Vaccines and Infectious Diseases Analytical Research Unit and is research chair in Vaccine Preventable Diseases of the Department of Science and Technology and the NRF. Um, Shabir currently serves as the chair of the National Advisory Group on Immunization in South Africa and is a member of the WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE, as we now know it, since 2019. Shabir has co-authored 460 scientific publications with his research focusing on epidemiology and clinical development of life-saving vaccines against pneumonia and diarrheal disease. Over the past decade, he has focused on vaccine development for the immunization of pregnant women for the benefit of these women and their young adults. He's also leading the first two COVID-19 vaccine studies being undertaken in Africa. So Shabir, thank you so much for joining us and over to you. You can share your screen and um, just take it from there. Marion, maybe Tom can answer some of the questions while we're waiting, if, if he's still on. I think Tom yeah, is still on. Great. Tom, would you mind doing that? Sure. Okay, so I was just typing out my response to the question about what can we learn from the COVID-19 experience. Um, well, I think what we can learn is that if there's sufficient um, investment, cooperation and urgency, then a lot can be done in a short time. Um, and I would argue that for TB, that's exactly what's needed, given the enormous burden and the problem that, that TB is. Uh, and hopefully we can, we can take some uh, or we, we can uh, use that as an example and perhaps rummage up some, uh, some advocacy to really highlight that just because TB uh, disproportionately affects countries where people are poor, that that's not a reason not to invest as much and as urgently into into this particular disease. Um, so I think there's an opportunity here to to really use this as a stepping stone and to highlight that uh, we need similar urgency for TB. Um, I've got the chat here on this other screen, so I have to look sideways. Um, Using a live attenuated like BCG, yeah, so BCG induces trained immunity, so uh, that's very clear. Um, in fact, there's a lot of evidence to show that BCG um, can, can change or, is, or modulate innate immune cells, which are usually short-lived and not known to have memory capacity. But BCG can train those cells to, be, <clears throat> to assume a slightly different uh, character where they can, in, over a period of time, uh, induce uh, better immunity against other types of infections such as viruses and fungi etc 
And so we do think that BCG may actually partly confer its protective effects through train immunity, but that does seem to be short-lived and certainly does not seem to last for many years as far as the evidence is showing. So um, I think I think we want to still induce and, and focus on vaccines that can induce antigen-specific immunity and memory uh, with vaccines. Um, um, so let me just look at the other ones here. Yeah, so, so there's a question about whether cell-mediated immunity or T-cell immunity needed for TB explains the difficulties with TB vaccine development. Um, yes, yeah, so so partly that is a that is one of the challenges. Um, but another part is that TB is just it's been with humans for a very long time. It's extremely well adapted. The organism has many escape mechanisms by which it can survive in the human host for a very long time. And to developing vaccine approaches that that generate immunity that can can get around that is is a is a big challenge. Um, I think that we are now, you know, advanced science and um, modern science is really uh, assisting us uh, to a large extent to figure out how that works and how we can circumvent that. And I'm pretty confident that we can get to uh, to vac to even more efficacious vaccine in the near term. I, I think it's very, very likely that we're going to get a newly licensed TB vaccine in the next five to ten years. And I think that could happen faster if there was more urgency and if we could could accelerate um, vaccine development in the same way that COVID has shown us. But I think it's unlikely that that will happen. And uh, and therefore, it, it's sort of a timeline of, of five to ten years, I would say. Let's try to see if there's any. Yeah, while well, you look for more questions, I'm just going to see if Shabi is ready online um, and with his other laptop. It appears not. So have you found any more questions? So there was a question which I did um, uh, type something about in the chats, but maybe I can quickly speak to that. So the, the question is about what is the effect of BCG in HIV infected individuals? Um, so BCG is a live bacterium. It can replicate in the body if there's immunocompromise. And so, um, especially if, uh, sort of in the past, there have been cases of BCGosis, so BCG disease, in, in young children who are born to HIV-infected mothers and then who have themselves been immunocompromised. Um, th so there used to be a WHO recommendation that BCG should not be given to babies born to HIV-exposed mothers. But this has actually been revised um, because of the success of the the program to prevent um, mother to child transmission, um, and because BCG is so important in preventing dis disseminated TB in, in young infants, um, so now is that that even babies who are born to exposed mothers should receive BCG because um, the benefits outweigh the risks. Um, in general, at the moment. Um, the plan is not to try and develop live attenuated vaccines like BCG for people who are HIV infected, but rather to focus on subunit vaccines or viral vectored vaccines, which cannot, so non, so attenuated viral vectors that cannot replicate in humans. And because those are much more likely to have a much better safety record. Um, but, um, but BCG should definitely now be given to young infants to, to prevent uh, TB, even if they are exposed. Um, what are your thoughts on using alive attenuated vaccines? Well, so there are many, there are actually um, a number of products that are being developed that are for TB that are based on live attenuated. Um, so um, there's, there are there are new BCG recombinant BCGs that that where they've been engineered to provide better immunity and to be even safer, so that they can even be given to people who are HIV infected. So that's in the pipeline. Um, there's also now live attenuated MTB mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, which is being developed and which looks quite promising. And in fact, there's now funding for a phase three trial of that product, which is called MTBVAC 
which will happen uh, probably start in the next year or two um, here in South Africa. Are there any current vaccines against any disease that primarily initiate an adaptive immune response? We can. Are there any current? Malika, I'm trying to understand your question. Are they, do you want to quickly, if Shabir is not yet on, do you want to maybe just ask it in the Hi, chat? Hi, Tom, yeah, the... myself. And you love, yeah. Uh, yes, <laughs> sorry, Tom. Um, basically, are there any vaccines that rather primarily initiate, uh, um, initiate an adaptive response rather than an, an antibody response for any disease, be it pneumonia or anything? And, and can we use any of that design to make new vaccines against TB? Okay. So first of all, um, just to say that antibodies are, of course, part of the adaptive immune system. So antibodies uh, are very specific and they actually undergo uh, um, modifications called um, through somatic uh, mutation to actually become extremely specific to any organism that they target. So they are part of the adaptive immune system. But I understand you're talking about T-cell immunity or, or cellular immunity. Um, Yes, there are many vaccines that are, that are currently given that induce T cells. Uh, we can measure those T cells. We know they are important. In fact, they are key to allow the antibody response to be effective because T cells can help B cells that make antibodies to actually undergo, undergo certain advancements that make those antibodies even better. Um, and we also know that for a number of, of diseases, um, T cells are also key in, in, in assisting the immunity. In fact, for COVID-19, and I'm sure perhaps Shabir can speak to this, sorry, my dog. Um, uh, uh, we know that the T cell response is actually part of the protective response against severe COVID. So there's one example where we know T cells are important. It's not only antibodies. We know for Ebola, for example, that T cells are really, really important. They, they are also part of the protective response. And for many other types of infections, T cells contribute to protection um, and are really important. And, uh, uh, but for many uh, diseases, we often measure antibodies because they are... Everyone's uh, okay, is Shabir back? Okay, I'll, I'll end there. It sounds like it should be us back, I think. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for those those great responses. So we're hoping that Shabi is online and your dog can now have peace and quiet. Uh, so anyway, thanks for the invite uh, to chat to you about COVID uh, vaccines. And I'm just going to briefly touch on three aspects. Uh, starting off with something which I think most of us are familiar with, uh, but really just to put it into the context of uh, what we can expect when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines and what some of the immunogenicity do, data do tell us and what it might, what we might be missing uh, when just looking at immune responses in terms of predicting uh, both the efficacy of vaccines against uh, mucosal infections uh, as well as uh, more severe disease. And then just briefly to touch on the horizon when it comes to COVID-19 vaccines and what the recent learnings have been when it comes to vaccine efficacy. So I think this Shabir, is familiar. Yeah. Should be sorry. Um, your slides are small. Can you put it on extended display, or will this send your new laptop into a frenzy? Uh, is it small? I don't know why is it small. It's on presenter view, Shabir. So if you do stop this displays then then it'll switch odd oh, not to worry if it just won't go we'll have to oh no there we go Except I've lost Shabir's presentation. Have you all lost it? Yeah. Yeah, Shabir, are you still there?
Okay. okay, so we might have to just quickly finish that email we were busy responding to while Shabia sorts his laptop out. Hello. I should be a great. We've got you back and uh, we've got your. Oh, that we've got your screen and on large. So thank you so much. OK, so uh, like I mentioned, I'm going to just start, uh, start off by discussing what we understand in terms of natural immune responses. Uh, just to highlight really two things and what we understand when it comes to human immune responses, what parts of uh, the immune system are being induced in terms of which component of the virus, as well as what it comes to mean in terms of uh, cell mediated immune responses. So I think all of us are obviously familiar, familiar is that the main uh, protein that the virus uses to gain entry into the cells are uh, the spike protein. And much of the first generation of COVID-19 vaccines, except for perhaps the inactivated whole cell vaccines, are really targeting the spike protein, and particularly the spike protein of the prototype virus or the original virus that was circulating. Uh, once uh, entering into the cells, obviously the virus makes use of the cell machinery in terms of its propagation. And uh, after being released from the cells, these new viral particles or peptides of the virus are taken up by your antigen presenting cell. And together with the assistance of your three helper cells, uh, we've got stimulation uh, and pro uh, proliferation of both B cells as well as cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Now, when it comes to the B cells, obviously what we're trying for is to get antibody, an antibody that is specific uh, to that components of the virus that are generally visible to the immune system. And those antibodies might serve one of two functions, either uh, what they call the blocking antibodies, so preventing the virus from adhering to the cells, as well as uh, assisting in terms of the destruction of the virus through alternate complement pathways. In addition to that, the cytotoxic T cells are especially important in terms of uh, destruction of cells that are already infected with the virus. And for both of these, ideally what we're wanting both from natural infection as well as from uh, vaccine-induced uh, immune responses is the development of longer-lasting B and T cells. Now, when it comes to the cytotoxic T lymphocyte uh, immunity, I think what's uh, important just to appreciate is that uh, there's a multiplicity of different epitopes that are stimulating the cytotoxic T lymphocytes or T lymphocyte responses. Unlike uh, when it comes to B cells and the antibody, the antibody are largely being restricted to specific uh, antigens uh, that are being presented to it, uh, with in probably a much more narrow spectrum of uh, antigens that are being presented in terms of B cell priming as opposed to the cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Well, what do we understand of uh, natural infection in terms of inducing both antibodies as well as the T lymphocyte responses. Uh, the first is that when it comes to antibody responses, there is a gradient uh, in terms of the magnitude of the antibody response, which might also influence the duration of that circulating antibody response. Uh, obviously, with the proviso that you're probably going to have memory cells, so the short, medium-term circulation of the antibody is probably not of that much significance in the context of uh, having prime for memory responses in terms of your uh, B cells. 
Uh, but what we see with antibody responses is that individuals that have exposure that were ne not necessarily confirmed to have been diagnosed with COVID, as well as asymptomatic individuals, uh, generally uh, a few, a lower percentage of them would actually have uh, antibody responses and the magnitude of the antibody response uh, probably will be highest in those that have developed severe disease. When it comes to your T lymphocyte responses, uh, it seems to be fairly much more similar, irrespective of just having had past exposure, or having had, had asymptomatic infection or mild illness or severe disease, where almost the majority of individuals that have had some exposure to the virus, uh, and even transient exposure so much so, that they might not actually have turned up with a positive PCR test, uh, it seems that they too uh, tend to induce these uh, T lymphocyte responses, which again, to emphasize, is much broader in terms of the repertoire of epitopes that are stimulating these uh, T lymphocyte responses. So uh, the, the development of COVID-19 vaccines has really been a spectacular success uh, for all intents and purposes. And this sort of just gives you a timeline in terms of when different organisms have been first identified relative to when vaccines have been introduced for those organisms uh, in the United States, as an example. As an example with typhoid, uh, it's almost a century from the time of discovery of what caused typhoid to when vaccines became available. Whereas when it comes to COVID-19, uh, we're literally talking of a period close on to just under 12 months, in fact. So all of us are also familiar of the different sort of technologies. And one of the reasons why we've been so successful in being able to develop COVID-19 vaccines over such a short period of time is because many of the technologies that have been used, uh, other than the tried and tested protein-based vaccines and either the life attenuated or inactivated virus-based vaccines, which are technologies on which we've largely framed uh, the development of vaccines in the past, the newer technologies, the nucleic acid and the viral vector-based vaccines are technologies which are very adaptable in terms of being able to target new pathogens or new uh, or incorporating new antigen targets. And although to date there hasn't been uh, any vaccine that was licensed using the messenger RNA technology, specific a vaccine per se, obviously this, this, this type of technology has been used in terms of immunotherapy when it comes to cancer as an example. Uh, for the viral vector-based vaccines, the first viral vector-based vaccine, uh, and I think this is a field that's familiar to most of you, is having been in the HIV space. But the first viral vector-based vaccine that was successfully licensed, in fact, last year was the Ebola vaccine. And again, the technology for this really is adaptable in terms of having a quick turnaround time with incorporating the genetic material of a new target uh, into these viral vector-based vaccines. The University of Oxford group and others as an example, uh, have previously uh, developed uh, vaccines against MERS as well as against SARS, which never went into full clinical development. They went into phase one and phase two trials. And that's the reason why they were sort of fast off the block in terms of developing that first generation of non-replicating viral vector-based vaccines. Uh, to date, there's one protein subunit based vaccine, which I'll discuss. So, where we stand currently is close to 150 different vaccines are uh, now uh, in being various stages of development, the majority of these in the preclinical phase. And then we've got close to 55 uh, that are now in human trials. Uh, and as you are aware, at least in the United States, there are two vaccines, both the messenger RNA based vaccines, that have been authorized for use. And elsewhere in other countries, we've got the AZ vaccine, the Sputnik V, the Sinopharm vaccine, and probably very soon the Johnson & Johnson and the Novavax vaccines that will also be authorized for use uh, globally. Uh, these vaccines obviously have got the different strengths uh, and different uh, pitfalls, especially when it comes to ability to scale up manufacture. As an example, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines together are expected, the two companies are expected to produce about 2 billion doses by the end of 2021, as opposed to AstraZeneca, where they estimate they'll be able to produce 3 billion doses by the end of 2021. And I think Janssen and Janssen is about 1.2, and Novavax is about 1.2 billion as well in terms of the efficacy of these vaccines, and these are a number of readouts that have come to us in the course of the past four to six weeks. And uh, I think uh, the initial results, certainly what came out from Moderna and Pfizer in a sense really uh, came completely unexpected. So just to backtrace, 
Uh, all of the regulatory authorities globally, including the WHO, in terms of its preferred target characteristics of a COVID-19 vaccine, were willing to accept any vaccine with an efficacy of greater than 50%, with the lower bound of that being greater than 20 or 30%, depending on the regulatory authorities. I don't think many people expected uh, for efficacy readouts uh, in the region of uh, 95% uh, for the messenger RNA-based vaccines, and particularly not when seeing that that type of efficacy was already evolving uh, soon after the first dose of vaccine when these messenger RNA vaccines uh, immune responses, especially in terms of the neutralizing antibody responses, is fairly modest. Uh, nevertheless, we got initial readouts of 95% both for Moderna as well as Pfizer. And then consistently across all of these vaccines, although the studies weren't necessarily designed to look at severe disease, uh, we find that the vaccine efficacy, the point estimate at least for severe disease, is all close on to 100% across the board uh, for all of these vaccines, irrespective of what the efficacy was for milder disease. So even as an example, when you look at the AstraZeneca vaccine, where the pooled analysis of the United Kingdom and Brazil gave a 70% overall efficacy, with a 90% efficacy for what was called a half full dose, although the main reason for that was the enhanced immunogenicity because of the increased interval between a half dose and a full dose, which resulted in a more immunogenic vaccine. But nevertheless, with all of these vaccines, we're getting close to 100% protection for hospitalization and death. Uh, the Novavax uh, vaccine included, uh, where we had efficacy reads out of 60% in South Africa, which I'll come back to, and 90% uh, uh, in the United Kingdom. So we've got vaccines uh, which varying, have probably got varying ability in terms of being able to protect against mild disease, but uh, uniformly, all of these vaccines seem to be performing extremely well, as well as one could want, uh, in terms of preventing severe disease and death. Now, I'm going to touch briefly on the Oxford the University, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and these are results from the South African study. And just to start off was by showing uh, that when looking at uh, the immune responses, and this is neutralizing antibody responses, uh, comparing the South Africans to the United their counterparts in the United Kingdom and Brazil, and this is two weeks after the second dose of vaccine, we find that the neutralizing antibody on your extreme right hand side is similar, if not in fact slightly better in South Africa than what was observed in Brazil and the United Kingdom, and similarly so after the first dose of vaccine. Uh, so there's very little issue around the immunogenicity of this vaccine, uh, including in terms of inducing uh, neutralizing antibody, which is really what we want thing for the, of these vaccines and which we think is an important feature, at least in terms of protection, protecting against mild and moderate infection. Now, as all of us are familiar, what happened in South Africa is we had this evolution of the V1351 variant, which started off in the Eastern Cape uh, in around about November. Uh, the study uh, that we enrolled into the AstraZeneca vaccine trial, in fact, uh, the start of that study coincided to the beginning of the first wave in South Africa. Uh, as shown by that gray bar. And over time, as the first wave started to subside, we actually had uh, very few endpoint cases and certainly none uh, that occurred at least two weeks after the second dose of the vaccine. Uh, subsequently, what happened is that around about November, the P1351 variant arrived, uh, uh, evolved in South Africa. And as you can see, just from the epidemic curve shown in gray, uh, the second, uh, the resurgence, uh, the second wave far exceeded the first wave in terms of absolute number of people that were infected, uh, as well as probably uh, was two to three times higher in terms of the number of COVID-19 deaths that occurred in the second wave compared to the first wave when using the medical the MRCs, excess mortality data. But what happened here now is that in the context of our study where we were wanting to look at efficacy at least two weeks after the second dose of the vaccine, uh, those sort of endpoint cases only started to accrue around about the middle of November and December. And in a post-hoc analysis, uh, after we did a final analysis, we decided to actually investigate what happened before the 31st of October. So this was a post-hoc analysis where we compared the vaccine efficacy against the uh, original virus uh, type that was circulating in South Africa and looking at uh, the efficacy at least 14 days after a single dose of the vaccine in South Africa, it's sort of uh, pretty much uh, you wouldn't want, you wouldn't expect anything better than this. 
uh, and that is 75% reduction in terms of COVID-19 in the vaccinated group compared to the placebo group. Uh, but this was just looking at endpoint cases that occurred right through to the 31st of October before the evolution of COVID-19. So the immunogenicity of this vaccine was uh, great. Uh, the neutralizing antibodies that we saw pretty much spoke to the type of efficacy readout that we got. And important to emphasize at this point uh, is that this particular study was enrolling a relative, it was a phase two study, it enrolled a relatively young age group demographic. Uh, the mean age was about 31 years and a very low prevalence of comorbidities. And almost all of the cases, two thirds of the cases uh, that counted to this uh, endpoints were mild infection and one third were moderate infection in the entire study we didn't actually have one case of severe COVID-19. So why is mutations important to us? Uh, obviously mutations are important for multiple levels and uh, my take in terms of why this particular variant uh, evolved in South Africa and why the P1 variant evolved in Brazil is that unfortunately in both of these countries, it was a consequence of a really high force of infection that took place during the course of the first wave. Uh, so we know that viruses mutate and there can be some sort of uh, reading errors in terms of the genome as they're replicating. But when you see the type of strategic mutations that have taken place, uh, that has taken place in the virus, uh, these are mutations that are really geared towards trying to evade the antibody responses that have been induced. And I think because of the high force of infection that took place in South Africa, as well as in Manaus in Brazil, where they estimate up to 70% of people in Manaus have been infected during the course of the first wave, the virus obviously comes under immunological pressure. And that immunological pressure is not uncommon. It's something that we experience each year. It's an example with seasonal influenza and with many other bacteria as well, uh, where there's sort of these sorts of mutations to try to evade that immune responses. Now, once having those sort of uh, immune evasive properties, uh, it's got a number of implications in terms of the epidemiology, in terms of whether past infection would protect against reinfection, in terms of the impact of the vaccines. And as we know, many of the monoclonal antibodies that were targeting the original virus have actually already been pulled in terms of not showing efficacy. And sometimes they've stopped uh, before even going into human trials because of predicted non-efficacy, because of the mutations that have arose. So this is just where we are currently. Uh, we're sort of in a reasonably good space right now. We're pretty much downward in terms of the second wave uh, trajectory. And we're probably going to plateau off now and for the next two to three weeks, and hopefully we'll remain uh, at that level. I estimate probably at least until May, June, before we get into the winter period. And then a combination of factors will probably result in another resurgence. The big unknown for the next resurgence is whether there's going to be further mutations of the virus, uh, which will result in what we experience this time round. And what we experience this time round essentially is a past infection during the course of the first wave, as I'll show you in the next two slides or so, unfortunately didn't confer any sort of protection against reinfection and COVID-19 associated with mild or moderate illness. Whether the past infection did confer some protection in terms of protecting against severe disease, I think that's unknown. It might well have, but when it comes to protecting against mild, moderate infection, I think we've got compelling data now to show that it actually didn't. So I'm not going to go through the multiple mutations. I think, again, all of us are familiar with this, except to say the N501 mutation obviously is important in terms of increased transmissibility, whereas the other mutations of the RBD and NTD, the N-terminal domain, are important in terms of the functionality of the antibody that's been induced by vaccination as well as by past infection due to the original virus. So we've got a, mut a mutant virus that has become resistant at least to antibody activity uh, from what has been induced with first generation uh, COVID-19 vaccines that have mainly been focused on the spike protein of the original uh, virus construct. And as we all know, uh, the, South, the variant that evolved in South Africa, the B1351, has now uh, gone into close on to 35 other countries. And in many of these countries, the, the countries shared in dark. These are countries where there is now actually community transmission of the virus, which means that the virus is very much seeded and it's actually rather than just being as isolated uh, imported cases where there's sort of community transmission taking place. And to some extent, 
uh, it's very likely that over the course of the next few months, uh, even where those countries are vaccinating, that you're going to start seeing outbreaks of the P1351 variant and possibly even the P1 variant that evolved in uh, Brazil, which is almost is very, very similar uh, to the South African P1351 variant in terms of the mutations. So why do I say that uh, previous infection doesn't protect against reinfection? So these were the unfortunate results of the Novavax study, where at the time when we enrolled into the Novavax study, which occurred after the first wave had plateaued, uh, what we ended up finding inadvertently is that 30% of participants that enrolled into the study were seropositive at the time of enrollment. So then what we did is we did an analysis of the placebo group amongst whom, like I mentioned, 50% had evidence of past infection and 70% didn't have evidence of serological evidence of past infection. And when looking at the case count, the number of COVID-19 cases that occurred at least seven days after the first dose of vaccine of injection in these individuals, they didn't receive vaccine, obviously, we find that uh, the rate of COVID-19, mild and moderate infection, was identical in these two groups, 4% each. And I think this is as compelling evidence that you can get in terms of a longitudinal follow-up study uh, that past infection doesn't protect, at least against mild and moderate infection. For past infection due to the prototype virus does not uh, protect against mild and moderate COVID-19 from the B1351 variant. Whether it protects against severe disease, uh, it might protect, uh, but that's an assumption that uh, with the mediators to protect against severe disease is different from what is required to protect against mild and moderate infection. So as we all know that uh, the study that, uh, the AstraZeneca study was actually just done in Gauteng in two centers in the Western Cape, and in particular in the Cape Metro, where the V1351 variant in both of these places uh, emerged roughly around about the middle of November. Uh, now, at the, the other study that was being done uh, at the same time was a Novavax study. And I think it's also important to mention the study. And our experience with a Novavax study, uh, again, where more than 90% 90, 90 of the endpoint cases were due to the V1351 variant, is that in South Africa, the vaccine efficacy in the HIV negative group was 60%, and in the United Kingdom, the vaccine efficacy was 90%. Now, this is again all for mild and moderate infection. So we do have vaccines that actually protect against mild or reduce your risk of developing mild and moderate infection, including due to the B1351 variant. Uh, the reason for the difference between South Africa and the United Kingdom uh, is that in the United Kingdom, although about half of the cases were due to the, the B117 variant, we know that variant doesn't contain the same sort of mutations that are likely to impact on the vaccine-induced antibody uh, responses. So this is sort of evidence that shows that uh, even for mild to moderate infection, there are some vaccines that might actually be able to protect, reduce the risk of developing mild and moderate infections uh, against a variant that's circulating in South Africa. Now, uh, so the study which uh, I'm I've been describing uh, is a study uh, which evaluated the University of Oxford uh, vaccine. And the most important uh, sentence you need to read here is the bottom part of this. And that this was an endpoint driven analysis and we were testing a specific hypothesis and that's the only question that we can answer. And that is whether the vaccine had 60% or greater efficacy with a lower bound of greater than 0%. If this vaccine efficacy was 50% or 40% against mild to moderate infection, we wouldn't be able to give you an answer to that. In addition to which, uh, we didn't plan on looking at severe disease and our population demographics that were enrolled, unfortunately, didn't lend itself to make an assessment as to whether the vaccine protects against severe disease. So when the B1351 variant uh, arose, uh, we were obviously concerned. And before we unblinded the study, we basically decided then to test the uh, samples of uh, individuals that were forming part of an initial group that were vaccinated, including some placebo recipients, uh, to see what impact uh, the variant had in terms of the neutralizing activity of the antibody that was induced by vaccine. So these are all vaccinated individuals. And as you can see, the left-hand side is your pseudonute assay, the right-hand side is a live newt assay. And the uh, readout of these are almost identical. Uh, in that, against the original virus, we had uh, a reasonable 50% uh, of the participants were uh, basically showed neutralizing activity at very high dilution, 
dilution of tetus, meaning that uh, they had good antibody going for them, uh, 50% intermediate. But against the variant, we find complete knockout in 80%, 78% of the participants. So basically, the neutralizing, acti activi the neutralizing antibody activity that was induced by the vaccine has pretty much uh, almost disappeared in about 78% of uh, participants, and this is on both of the assays. So it didn't come too much of a shock. It came as a great disappointment because I was still hoping against hope uh, after having seen the pseudo mute and mute as the results that the vaccine might do something against uh, our primary endpoint uh, where all of this, um, the majority of this endpoint cases only accrued uh, from the middle of November onwards. And unfortunately, what we know and what you know by now uh, is that a vaccine efficacy uh, point estimate was 22%, uh, and of the, we were able to sequence 41 uh, of the endpoint cases, and of the 41.39 were due to the B1351 variant for which the vaccine efficacy point estimate is 10%, which basically means that we got absolutely no evidence uh, that this vaccine uh, works. And certainly we didn't meet our uh, hypothesis, we didn't, uh, our hypothesis uh, was basically not tested, that we didn't have efficacy of greater than 60 percent. So the big question that we face is can the Jadox vaccine still protect against severe disease, especially in high-risk groups? So obviously all of us are familiar with the data that's been published also on a Johnson & Johnson vaccine where in South Africa and in this particular instance they purposely enrolled in a phase three study individuals that were at high risk of developing severe disease. And that's the reason why they were able to actually get the readout for moderate and severe disease. And what they were able to show uh, in South Africa was 57% efficacy against moderate to severe disease, as opposed to, I think, 77% efficacy in the United States against the same spectrum. And then in South Africa, 89% efficacy against severe disease and death. Now, what do we know of these two vaccines, the AstraZeneca vaccine and the Janssen and Janssen vaccine? And this is an acetonute assay that's done in the same laboratory. And looking at the antibody responses after the first dose to both of these vaccines, you find that the IC50 uh, is almost identical. So the immune responses in terms of neutralizing antibody activity that is induced by these two vaccines after a single dose, and remember the Johnson Johnson vaccine study was a single dose, it gives you an identical readout in terms of neutralizing antibody activity. Yet we find that the one has got high efficacy and the other one has got no efficacy, but we obviously can't make that comparison. Uh, because we didn't evaluate the vaccine in the same sort of population demographic and the endpoints that were being that the vaccine efficacy was reading out for are very very different with the AstraZeneca vaccine predominated two-thirds of the endpoint cases being mild infection whereas Johnson and Johnson like Glenda would say simply weren't interested in terms of seeing how the vaccine works against the sniffles so what I've tried to emphasize is that in addition to uh, BCL immunity and antibody, there's obviously the role of T lymphocytes. And these are some recent unpublished data, which is actually in the manuscript that's now available as a preprint, uh, to try to so tease out exactly what is the magnitude of T cell responses that is induced by the AstraZeneca vaccine. And what we find is that uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine induces T cell responses to about to up to 87 different spike-specific antigens, uh, both CD4 as well as CD8 uh, T cell responses. And out of those 87, 76 of them are not impacted by the B135 uh, site mutations. And in fact, the most dominant T cell responses uh, to the AstraZeneca vaccine are actually responses to epitopes which are not affected by the B1351 mutations. So wh what do we know? So is it much that we can make of this sort of data? Remember the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and AstraZeneca vaccine used identical technology. They're both non-replicating vector-based vaccines. They induce almost an identical neutralizing antibody response. Uh, there is some differences perhaps in terms of the stabilization of the spike protein, where the Johnson & Johnson being a more stabilized pre-fusion spike protein. But whilst that would be important in the context of neutralizing antibody, it's less important in the context of T-cell responses, because your T-cell responses is basically responses to cleaved and degraded proteins, rather than at the entire whole spike protein being presented to the T-cells in terms of that in immune responses. In addition to which, what we do know from macaque challenge models is that uh, even if antibody responses are suboptimal, cellular immune responses 
do contribute to protecting against severe COVID-19 in a challenge model. So in conclusion, uh, what we basically showed in our study uh, is that the AstraZeneca vaccine was per working perfectly well, as well as one can expect against the original virus that was circulating. But when it came to the B1351 variant, unfortunately, this vaccine does not protect against mild and possibly even moderate infection. Uh, the Novavax vaccine, on, in contrast, does protect against mild and moderate infection from the B1351 variant. And to date, this is the only vaccine that can make a claim to protect against mild to moderate infection from the B1351 variant. Uh, what I haven't shown you is data for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, where they show between a six and a half to eight and a half fold reduction in terms of neutralizing antibody responses uh, to the variant. And the clinical relevance of that is what needs to be tested. And for Novavax, we have also done that testing in terms of antibody responses, and those antibody responses against the variant is much better preserved uh, than what we observe for AstraZeneca vaccine. So in the context of these two vaccine contracts, the J&J and the AstraZeneca vaccine having comparable, comparable neutralizing antibody against the original variant, it does raise a question as to whether what one can expect from the AstraZeneca vaccine in terms of protecting against severe disease and how that might compare to the 89% reduction that was observed for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine against severe disease due to the B1351 variant. So the evolution with the SARS-CoV-2 variant, uh, in my mind at least, uh, has probably really evolved because of immune evasion, uh, because of the massive amount of large infections that took place within the course of the first wave. But I think we're probably on a pathway where we're going to continue seeing these sort of mutations continue arising. And especially where there's a sluggish rollout of vaccines, I think getting uh, response, getting mutations that are much more directed to that vaccine induced antibody is very high likelihood. So we probably need to start thinking of recalibrating, not just uh, to how we respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in terms of our expectation of COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, but COVID-19 vaccines still remain the only sustainable option for reducing severe disease and death. Uh, and certainly in my mind requires urgent uh, targeted approach to the high risk groups. Uh, I don't think that we in a space any longer to be speaking about COVID-19 vaccines taking us to herd immunity, especially not the current generation of COVID-19 vaccines. I think there'll be another generation of COVID-19 vaccines where this might change, but for the current generation and, and with evolution of the type of mutations you're seeing, to what is the primary target of these vaccines, I think it's still a long path to travel before we're going to get vaccines to take us to that herd immunity threshold. So thank you for your attention. Shabir, thank you so much for that. That was a wonderful presentation. Have you got time for a couple of questions? I do, I've got exactly three minutes before I need to join Asaf on the same talk. <laughs> Great. Okay. So are there a couple of quick questions for Shabir? There's one in the chat box, Shabir, which says, um, how well valid, if it's from Tamara, how, there are actually two questions. The first one is, which COVID-19 vaccine would be given to pregnant women with comorbidity, uh, given the possibility of side effects to the baby? That's the one question. And the second is, how well validated is the association between neutralizing antibodies and clinical outcomes? Yeah, so in terms of the question of pregnancy, so currently WHO recommends for the use of both the messenger RNA vaccines as well as the AstraZeneca vaccine in pregnant women that are at high risk of developing severe disease. Uh, but there are studies that are currently underway, including in South Africa, that will be looking at the safety and efficacy. But in the absence of those data, uh, right now we're going with sort of a risk-benefit approach in that uh, there isn't uh, very much uh, sort of theoretical reasons to be concerned that these vaccines would be harmful in pregnancy. So like I said, WHO has made recommendations for both the messenger RNA and the AstraZeneca vaccine, and they'll be looking at the other vaccines in the course of the next one or two weeks. Uh, in terms of uh, the neutralizing antibody and it being a correlate of protection, uh, I think what the data currently tells us is that in fact, neutralizing anti we're gonna need quite a different correlate of protection for different spectrum of disease. 
and it's not unco it's not uncommon. It wouldn't be unique to COVID, uh, where different sort of uh, immune readouts has got different implications in terms of whether you're able to protect against mild infection or severe disease. I've been really surprised by just the low quantity of antibody, neutralizing antibody that you require to get able to protect against uh, severe, it's not severe disease, against mild infection. Yes, we've seen with the messenger RNA vaccines, where even after the first dose, when the immune responses that have been induced are really, really modest, they were already able to show protection against a mild infection. So the exact correlate of protection against mild infection, moderate infection is currently being a sort of uh, unbundled with the efficacy trials that's now been completed. Uh, but I don't think it's going to, I don't think utilizing antibody is going to be the readout uh, for what is required to protect against severe disease. And the basis of that is the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, uh, those experiments in terms of how the neutralizing antibody uh, performs against the variant, those experiments are underway. And I would be happy to wager a bet uh, that you're going to see exactly the same sort of knockout uh, that we saw with AstraZeneca, yet you're able to show 89% reduction in severe disease. So it's certainly not neutralizing antibody that's driving that protection against severe disease. Should be a thank you for that. And there's a flood of questions, but I'm afraid that I think I'm just going to have to end here, given the time. Shabir's got a commitment, and I'm sure other people also have noon commitments. So, Shabir, thank you so much for your time at this extraordinary time of, of the year of life. Um, thank you also to Tom, and thank you to Reshmi and Nigel for all being part of today's seminar. And I'm just going to ask Amina to close the seminar for today, because uh, Amina's also got to rush off to an important COVID vaccine meeting. Thanks so much, Marion, and thanks everybody. I think for me, it's just to reiterate what Marion has said and to thank the organizers of the symposium. So Marion and Ari and Anita, thank you so much for everything that you've done. Um, Alfred for the communication. Uh, and then, of course, to the speakers, uh, to Tom, to Shabir, uh, to Nigel and to Reshmi, thank you so much. This has been such a, a wealth of information that you've shared today. And I see people asking for the presentations uh, as well as the recording. So I'm pretty sure we'll try and organize that. Um, I think as we move forward, you know, COVID-19 has really brought about unprecedented collaborations. Um, and for me, I was so encouraged when I saw the, the range of in, institutions um, whose uh, staff members have joined the symposium today. So we've had colleagues from such a huge range of institutions in our country. And I think, you know, if we can build on these collaborations moving forward, it would uh, set us up for um, excellent research moving forward. Because um, as we put our brains together, we can only do better. And so I'd really like to thank everybody for attending the symposium. Apologies that we ran slightly late. Uh, we'll do our best to get the recordings as well as the presentations out to you. And I think uh, let's build on these uh, relationships. Let's build on these linkages so that we can foster new collaborations, because I really think that that's the way forward for all of us. Uh, so thanks so much, Marion, um, and thanks, everybody. Uh, and with that, we close the symposium. And uh, all the best, have a good day, and please stay safe. Uh, and if you know healthcare workers, please get them to register on the EVDS, the electronic vaccine system. It's the only system that people can use to get, well, not the only system, but it's the main system that we're using for people to get access to the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, the rollout is starting soon. It is being rolled out as part of a phase 3B trial. Um, so it's completely voluntary. It's just an interim measure uh, until the J&J &J vaccine is approved in South Africa. And so if you do know of people who are health workers, and if you are one, please do make sure that you are registered. And make sure that you register for one of the 17 sites that are earmarked for uh, the initial rollout, so the, the rollout of the initial batch. Uh, we have a list. If you need to know the list, uh, we're very willing to share that with you, uh, because that is the way to get access to the J&J &J vaccine for now. Um, there will be other vaccines coming, and so this is not the only option, and it's not the last option, it's just an early option. Um, so please do keep an eye out for that. 
Uh, although I mentioned the electronic system, that is the preferred system, but if people prefer to do the, uh, the registration at their hospitals, I think the selected hospitals will be setting up some kind of a booth so that you can do a registration either using paper-based um, or electronic. But even at the hospital, electronic is preferred. So please just take that message out, especially for health workers. This is for health workers. Uh, and so please do take that message out. And with that, uh, close the meeting. Uh, thanks very much, everybody, and keep safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Cheers, Nina. Bye. Bye.